بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ده أنا يشرفني يشرفني فعلا إني أرحب وأقدم أول ليزر كورس أو ليزر ويبينار عندنا في شرم دير السبب فرحتي بالموضوع ده وجود أستاذنا الدكتور أشرف وأشرف بدوي من الأساتذة اللي أسسوا الليزر مش في مصر الصراحة والميدل إيست لا إحنا بنبقى فخورين إن هو أسس علم الليزر في في مصر فعلا مش شرق الأوسط وهو أستاذنا فأنا يشرفني وإن أنا أرحب به الأستاذ الدكتور أشرف بدوي هو أستاذ علم الليزر وأستاذ الأمراض الجلدية في معهد الليزر أنا 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 عن بالنيابة عن كل الزملاء في شرم ديرما أرحب بيه فعلا جدا ده هيدونا إيه النهارده؟ هيدونا بيزك كورس بيزك كورس هما معمول ومتظبط بواسطة الأستاذ الدكتور أشرف بدر وهو نائب رئيس الأكاديمية الأوروبيان أكاديمي لعلوم الليزر ومعاه مين؟ وده مهم قوي معاه الدكتوره الاستاذه الدكتوره عبير استاذه علم الليزر ومين معاهم طبعا الدينامو بتاعنا كلنا الاستاذ الدكتور شادي محمود هم هيدونا ايه؟ خدوا بالكم هي دي معموله على تو تو سيشنز او اتنين نمره واحد واتنين وتلاته واربعه هيدونا البيزك بس المرة دي هيبقى في حتة ابلايد ايه هي الابلايد بقى ان ازاي ننظف الاجهزة ازاي الاجهزة نعرفها هنعمل بيزك ازاي خد اليومين دول بالذات مع وجود الكورونا فيروس و و و و محتاجين ان احنا نعرف شوية مين العيان اللي قدامي ده هقدر اعمل له آه ليزر ولا مش هعمله الحتة دي كلها كده كده على بعضها زي ما بقول دايما هي دي اللي عايزين نتعلمها من الاساتذة في اور فيرست ويبينار ان ليزر وده تو بارس ده النهاردة هنعمل الفيرست بارت وبعد شوية هنعمل السكند بارت اعيد تاني واقول انا برحب باستاذنا كلنا في في الليزر الاستاذ الدكتور اشرف بدوي ويا رب يا رب كلكم تستفادوا زي ما احنا كلنا ان شاء الله مستنيين ده وشكرا. Those lasing media are materials which are having the capability of producing photons when they are stimulated. When they are stimulated. And those lasing media can be of different types. We can have gas like the carbon dioxide laser or like the excimer laser. It can be liquid, like the pulse dye laser, where we have a liquid dye called cumarine or rhodamine. And it can be solid, like the alexandrite laser or the ruby laser or the endiag laser. Those are solid state lasers. And it can be also uh, a diode laser, so semiconductor, and this is the diode laser. So all those are different laser media. All are characterized by the ability of producing photons when stimulated. So this is the first word uh, of light. So this is the lasing medium, which we discussed. This lasing medium is not going to produce photons simultaneously. It needs to be stimulated. So this stimulation or pumping source can be electrical, can be optical. Optical is the most popular now in the flash lamps, but it can be electrical as well. And uh, in, in many cases, uh, those pumping sources, when they work, they will start to stimulate the lasing medium. So the lasing medium will start to produce photons. Each photon produced is going to stimulate another atom inside the lasing medium in order to produce a similar photon. And then each produced photon is going to stimulate another atom and the photon production will start to increase. If this is the assembly of the laser system, then we would need to switch on the laser machine and wait for 
seven hours in order to get a laser beam. And this laser beam is not going to be of enough intensity. So because of that, we need to amplify. We need to fasten the reaction. And this fastening, this amplification is going to happen by using two mirrors. One totally reflective mirror, which is going to reflect back the photons, which are going to be traveling into the direction of the mirror. And then they are going to be reflected back. While they are reflected back and traveling back, they are going to stimulate more atoms inside the lasing medium, producing more photons till they reach to the other mirror, which is not 100% reflective. It's only 95% reflective. As long as the intensity of the laser beam is weak, uh, this beam of light or laser is going to be again reflected back. And this oscillation between the two mirrors is going to continue producing more photons till we get enough intensity of the laser beam in order to be able to get out of the partially reflective mirror and produce its effect. So this is the process of producing a laser beam. So now when we are saying that laser is light, because at the end laser beam is composed of light, it is photons. So it's a type of light with special characters, but at the end it is light. Amplification, because there is a reaction which we created here inside the lazy medium, and we amplified it by the two mirrors, by stimulated, because we stimulated the lazy medium by the pumping source. Emission of radiation, because at the end light is a kind of radiation. It is non-ionizing radiation, and this is a major difference between lasers and other types of ionizing radiation. However, it is radiation. So when we say light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, we understand fully the meaning of each word and why it has been put in place like that. Light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. This is a, a diagram which is showing an example of a laser system. It's called helium neon laser. It's a laser which is not very popular now. It's used mainly in the physiotherapy and in the code laser applications, uh, stimulation of wound healing and uh, stimulation of hair growth uh, and uh, rejuvenation and so on. It's not very popular now because now we have the LED, the light emitting diodes, but this example of a laser is composed of a laser cavity which is containing a mixture of helium and neon gas this is the lasing medium and in this case this is a gas laser then we have to have a pumping source the pumping source in this case is electrical one cathode and anode so this is the pumping source which is going to stimulate the lasing medium to start the production and the initiation of producing photons and then we have to have the mirrors, 100% reflective mirror. And the other one is partially reflective mirror. It's 95% uh, reflective. So this is the laser assembly. And any laser system has to have those components in order to be able to produce the laser. Now there is a, a missing part, which is called the delivery system. The laser beam, which is getting out of the cavity, needs to be delivered to the skin so that we are able to uh, uh, conduct the laser treatments. So we might have an optical fiber, uh, like most of the laser machines. We can have um, uh, an articulated arm, like the carbon dioxide and the Urbaniag lasers, and some of the Q-switched lasers. And also, it can be a bare fiber, where we can use the lasers through the bare fiber to go into the tissue, like treating uh, uh, the uh, hemangiomas, for example or doing lipolysis or doing endovenous laser treatments through this bare fiber, which is going to carry the laser from the laser cavity up to the tissue to be treated. So those are the components of the laser system. Uh, an important um, point to be in mind that where are the areas of wear and tear? Definitely the lasing medium after some time can be exhausted. And that's why sometimes the cavity needs to be changed. If the lazy medium was exhausted, if the gas was exhausted or the uh, uh, rod of the laser uh, started to be weak and producing photons because of the exhaustion of the material, then this is the time to change the cavity. And this is an expensive part. 
sometimes those mirrors are having wear and tear. So from the repeated hitting of the photons in the center of the mirror, it's going to be damaged and the coat is going to be damaged. So uh, many of the manufacturers now are having double coated mirrors so that the technician will come and just change the direction of the mirror so that the back would be, come to the front and then we can use it again. So this is a, a more economic way instead of throwing the mirror uh, away, then they can do this uh, flip of the mirror in order to use it a bit more. So those are components which are exposed to the wear and tear. Of course, the delivery system can be also damaged. Optical fiber, after some time, they can be damaged and the transmission is going to be less. So we can see that the delivered energy at the hand piece is going to be much less than the output energy from the cavity. And this is where uh, the optical fiber needs to be changed. Also, the articulated arms are having different mirrors in order to uh, uh, reflect the laser beam towards the handpiece. And sometimes those mirrors need to be aligned or they can be damaged where uh, some of them might need to be changed. So this is the component, those are the components of the laser system, which uh, sometimes might need uh, technical service. Now, uh, some important points which we need to always remember is the background, what is uh, the laser? Laser is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is a wide range of uh, rays and waves. So this is starting by the cosmic rays, and then we have the X-rays, and then the ultraviolet. Then we have the visible light. Then we have the invisible light, infrared uh, light. Then we have the microwave the TV and FM radio, and then the AM radio. This is called the electromagnetic spectrum. Two very important practical points here. One, and this is very important, that this electromagnetic spectrum, we can uh, divide it into two big important components. One, the ionizing radiation. Two, the non-ionizing radiation. When it comes to the ionizing radiation, we have a limit for exposure. If the exposure increased, uh, then there is risk and this can damage tissue and it can damage DNA. And that's why there is a limit for exposure. Uh, the uh, medical staff who are working in the field of the X-ray, they have a badge which they put on their coat, which is measuring the exposure to the uh, X-ray. And when there is a certain limit, they have to stop the exposure. Otherwise, there is significant health risk. However, with non-ionizing radiation, we don't have a limit. We don't have that risk because non-ionizing radiation does not have the same damaging effect the ionizing radiation can uh, pose. So this is important. This is the answer for many people who are asking are there limits to the number of sessions we are exposed to? Is it a problem that I got 20 sessions of laser hair removal? Do I need to stop at a certain limit? No, there is no limit because this is non-ionizing radiation. And this is also the answer when we talk about laser and pregnancy. And this is a point which we'll discuss later. But because laser is non-ionizing radiation, so we don't have uh, risks which are associated with the ionizing radiation. The other important point here is the fact that when we are dealing with lasers, either it is ultraviolet, like the excimer laser, which uh, we use in order to treat the uh, ultraviolet responsive skin diseases, like psoriasis, vitiligo, uh, lichen planus, sometimes atopic dermatitis. Uh, so we are using at that time the excimer laser, which is ultraviolet laser. And all the, the hazards of the exposure to the ultraviolet lasers, including the photosensitivity and photosensitizing medications should be kept into considerations. However, when we are dealing with visible light lasers or infrared lasers, then the photosensitivity is not becoming an issue. So that's why I sometimes I don't understand why in many laser manuals, we have this contraindication photosensitivity or photosensitivity inducing uh, uh, medications. Because if you are using the diode laser 
or the NDI lasers, which are infrared lasers, then there is no risk for the skin. This is heat. Also, if I'm using the visible lasers, the pulsed dye laser, the KTP, the ruby laser, the alexandrite laser, all of them are in the visible spectrum and photosensitivity is not an issue because usually photosensitivity means sensitivity to the ultraviolet radiation. Having said that, it's important to know that if I'm using the urban YAG laser or the carbon dioxide laser, or even if I'm using the Q-switched lasers for tattoo removal, and there was a sort of injury on the skin. Now we have a wound. And if the patient is having photosensitivity, during the healing process, if the patient was not protected from the sun, then there is risk of hyperpigmentation because of the photosensitivity. It's not due to the laser. So we have to be thinking like dermatologists. We have to uh, understand the pathophysiology. We have to know what we are doing to the skin, whether it is laser or it's cautery or high fricator or cryo surgery or whatever. And what is the injury we are inducing in the skin? And what are the general conditions of that patient? And then we are going to decide if this is a contraindication or not a contraindication. So again, the phobia of the photosensitivity when we are using the lasers is not always true. However, we have to keep into consideration that if the patient is having photosensitivity and we use a procedure with lasers which are causing wound in the skin, uh, the uh, sun protection is becoming essential. Otherwise, during the healing process, there might be higher incidence of hyperpigmentation due to the photosensitivity for those patients. Now, um, it's also important to realize that we can uh, get the four ranges of clinical light, which is the ultraviolet, the visible, the near infrared, and the mid infrared, either by using lasers or by using the pulsed light devices, which are popular devices present all over the world. And we have a lot of uh, literature about using the uh, IPL in the dermatology field. We are going to discuss the difference between the laser and the IPL in a few minutes. However, before that, it's very important to remember that we have something called laser tissue interaction. Each pulse of laser uh, is going to be uh, uh, emitted towards the uh, skin surface. We are having certain energy we put in the laser pulse and we expect that this energy is going to affect a certain target in the skin. And this target should be affected, whether we want to damage it or we want to stimulate it or whatever effect we would like to get. And we expect the effect to happen in full. However, what happens is that this beam of light, when it is applied to the skin, it is not going to be penetrating 100%. Portion of that beam of light is going to be reflected from the surface. Another portion is going to be scattered from a deeper layer. Then there is absorption. We hope that the absorption is going to happen in our target. In the chromophore, we are intending to affect. However, the absorption doesn't happen only in that chromophore. There is something called competing chromophore. If I'm targeting a hair follicle, then I would like to affect the melanin in the hair follicle. But the melanin is not present only in the hair follicle, it's also present in the epidermis. So the absorption will happen by the epidermal melanin and will happen also by the hair follicle melanin. So there is absorption in different areas, areas which we want to happen and some areas which we want to minimize. In addition to that, we don't have absolutes in this life. There is nothing 100%. Even I have, if I have a melanin specific laser, it is not 100% melanin and 0% in the other chromophores. Other chromophores will have also some absorption. So even if I'm using a laser which is targeting mainly melanin like alexandrite, there is some absorption by oxyhemoglobin and there are some blood vessels in the, in the skin. So there will be some partial absorption by the other chromophores. So the absorption is happening in different chromophores. We hope that we are able to be as specific as possible by confining the heat into our target and our 
chromophore of intention and less on the other structures in the skin. So the absorption is what we hope to get the effect from. Then there is forward scattering and finally there is transmission. Those are laser tissue interactions. And because of this disruption of the distribution of the laser energy, we are obliged to use much higher energy than what we actually need. If I'm, if I'm using the diode laser for hair reduction, depending of course on the system, but I might need three, four joules in order to damage a hair follicle, three, four joule per centimeter square. But practically speaking, because all of this disruption and because of the reflection and scattering absorption by other chromophores, I am forced to use much higher fluence than what I actually need, because I know that if I use 30 joule per centimeter square, out of the 30, I'll, I'll be able to deliver only three or four, maximum five joule per centimeter square into the hair follicle, which is my target. And that's why it is important to use the appropriate fluence, which is ensuring efficacy without damaging the skin. And this is going to uh, be discussed in a few minutes how to optimize the parameters of the laser. However, in this slide, there are two important points which I would like to highlight. In order to do a good job as laser practitioners, we have to minimize the amount of reflection and scattering from the laser beam so that we are having more energy to be delivered to the target. How can we decrease the reflection and scattering by two important uh, uh, ways? Number one, we have to work on um, a clean, clear surface. This means that if the skin is covered by makeup or sunscreen or um, um, sweat or sebum, this has to be cleaned in order to have better penetration of the laser. Second thing, if you are using a laser which is having no contact, non-contact with a spacer, it's very important to always hold the handpiece perpendicular on the surface of the skin because we know from the physics that perpendicular beam of light will have less scattering and reflection. So those are two important things which we have to remember. Of course, if we have contact uh, handpiece, then it is already in touch with the skin. So this is not an issue, but if it is non-contact handpiece, it is always very important to keep the handpiece perpendicular on the surface of the skin. Now there are two very important uh, uh, terms which we need to understand and differentiate. I don't know if Dr. Shadi and Dr. Abir are uh, with us and they can interact with us or no. I can see that they are muted. However, uh, I would appreciate if they are able to uh, be uh, involved with us. Uh, so uh, okay. yes, you're you are welcome Dr. Shadi and Dr. Abir. Now, uh, can we understand what is the difference between chromophore and target? For example, if we talk about hair removal, if we would like to do laser assist hair removal, what, what is the target? What do we want to damage? أولا دكتور أشرف أنا بشكرك على المحاضرة الهائلة دي جدا ومعلش قبل ما نجاوب على السؤال عاوزين نقول بس نقط مهمة من بعض الكومنز اللي جات لنا من الناس إن هما بيقولوا إحنا يعني مش عايزين فيزيكس إحنا عاوزين نشوف تريننج لا ما هو أنتوا لو ما شفتوش الأول الفيزيكس وفهمتوه على إيدين أحسن حد بيعرف يشرح ليزر فيزيكس في العالم كله مش هتعرفوا بعد كده تفهموا أي تفاصيل تانية ما فيش استعجال إن أنتوا عاوزين بسرعة تشوفوا يعني شغل لا لازم تفهموا الأول ليزر فيزيكس دي نقطة برضو في نقطة تانية علشان دكتور أشرف أنا إذا كنت بخرج برا السياق شوية كانوا في حد بيقول نقطة ال ال ultraviolet rays ال ultraviolet is ionizing or not ionizing لا ال ال هو هنا حصل له زي confusion شوية فإذا في إمكانية حضرتك توضح النقطة دي قبل ما ننقل لنقطة تانية إنه كاتب ال ultraviolet is ionizing or not ionizing ultraviolet is non ionizing طبعا ما هوش it's not ionizing ال ionizing هو ال X-ray وال gamma rays إنما ال ultraviolet طبعا ما هوش ionizing radiation ولكن لما بنستخدم ال ultraviolet بيبقى في إيشو الموضوع بتاع الفوتوسنستيفيتي إنما it is non ionizing radiation 
اه ودي النقطه الثانيه اللي حضرتك اثرتها ودي مهمه جدا 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 لانه معظم الناس اللي بيشتغلوا دكتوراه بيكتبوا فوتو سنسيتيفيتي تو بي افويدد وهم مش عارفين ليه فوتو سنسيتيفيتي فهنا الفوتو سنسيتيفيتي ممكن تحصل مع نوع معين من الليزر اللي هو الاكزيمر ليزر حضرتك بتوافقني على كده بالظبط طبعا طبعا الاكزيمر ليزر طبعا لكن بس النقطه النقطه الثانيه يا دكتور عبير ودي انا برضو حاولت ان انا اوضحها ان أيوة. حتى الاذر تايبس اوف ليزر لو هم نون ابليتيف وما حصلش اي ديسربشن للابيديرمس ما عندناش اي مشكله. انما لنفرض ان احنا بنعمل حاجه ابليتيف. ايوه وحد عنده فوتو سنسيتيفيتي. المشكله مش هتحصل من الليزر، ما عندناش مشكله من الليزر لان ات از انفراريد سواء السي او 2 او الاربن ياج، ولكن احنا بقى عندنا في ووند لو العيان عنده فوتو سنسيتيفيتي وابتدى يحصل هيلينج من غير ما يبقى في سان بروتكشن كفايه ساعتها هيبتدي يحصل هايبر بيجمنتيشن بانسدنس اعلى بسبب الوند هيلينج اللي هو ما هوش بروتكتد في عيان عنده فوتو سنسيتيفيتي ده اللينك فاحنا حبيب. محتاجين دايما وده عشان كده بنقول ان في فرق كبير بين ان اللي بيشتغل بالليزر حد هاز ميديكال باك جراوند اور سم وان هو از نوت هافينج ذس كايند اوف نوليدج ذن ذا انسيدنس اوف بروبلمز مايت بي هاير اف ات از نوت يعني بروبرلي ادريسد ذوز ايشوز صحيح يعني ده بيز لازم الناس تبقى فاهماه كويس قوي ان احنا النهارده بتحط الفاونديشن بتاع ان واحد هيبتدي يشتغل ليزر لازم افهم كويس قوي الفيزكس بتاعتنا في نقطه في نقطه ثانيه برضو اثروها في, في الاسئله انه هل هيبقى جزء تريننج فاحنا بنقول لهم لا النهارده الجزء ده انت بت بت بتعمل ستريس على ان تفهم الفيزكس بعد كده هتعرف الشغل هيجي بعد كده ازاي دي حاجه نقطه حضرتك اثرتها برده مهمه قوي دكتور اشرف لو الهاند بيس مش ان كونتاكت مع السكان دي نقطه في منتهى الخطوره لانه ناس كتير هو في صدى صوت شويه لا انا انا سامع صوت كويس سامعني كويس يا يا كانوا بيقولوا انه ليه بيحصل مثلا بيجمنتيشن او بيرن واحنا بنشتغل الهير ريدكشن ده ليه مثلا هو دي في الـ في الكلينيكال بارت اللي في الاخر هيبقى في بعض الصور اللي احنا هنقدر ان احنا نتكلم على الموضوع ده في حد بيقول ان الصوت مش واضح مش عارف ليه ولكن انا انا اي جاست وونت تو كومنت يا دكتور عبير انه اولا شارم بيرما they made a questionnaire about the topics of interest and most of the people requested the basics عشان كده that's why we are starting with the basic laser physics and laser tissue interaction. Having said that, yeah, having having said that, all the points I discussed till now are practical points, and I I didn't discuss what and joule. What is the definition of joule? What is the definition of uh, what I'm talking about? What do we need in order to get the best effect? What is the uh, the, the the risk of photosensitivity? versus uh, you know uh, with different types of lasers so uh, without understanding those basics we cannot do a good job in the practical in the clinical and every single information we discussed so far are having a very important practical uh, applications uh, we we never discuss something theoretical without any uh, uh, practical and clinical importance تمام تمام ده مهم جدا جدا من غيره ما حدش هيقدر يفهم الليزر ولا هيقدر انه يقدر يعني يجيب اوي فروم ذا كومبليكيشن تمام تمام دكتور دكتور اشرف اشكرك كتير جدا والله معلومات قيمه جدا ولو ما خدناش النهارده معلومات البيزك دي صدقني يعني هيفقدوا كتير جدا انه يفهم الجهاز بتاعه ويحافظ عليه دي حاجه مهمه جدا احنا كتير قوي بيعرفوا يشتغلوا ولكن ما بيعرفوش يعرفوا الاندر لاينج يعني حتى لما يبقى المهندس اللي انا معاه ما بيبقاش ما بيبقاش فاهم نقط بسيطه ممكن يقدر يجادل فيها مهندس صيانه ويقدر يوصل لافضل حل للجهاز بتاعه. تمام. انا هرجع بس ما نضيعش وقت. انا هستاذن حضرتك اللي عاوز يحط سؤال يحطه على الكويتشن ده انصر مش الشاتنج عشان نقدر نتابعه. رقم اثنين هنرجع للبوينت بتاعت سؤال حضرتك الكروموفور ان تارجت. تمام. كروموفور ان تارجت دي حاجه يمكن الثاني الشهير فيها الفاسكولار والهير ريدكشن. لان انا عندي في الهير عندي كروموفور هعتبره الميلانين وعندي تارجت اعتبره الستيم سيلز والباسر اللي بيعمل فيدنج للهير بورتال 
بالضبط uh, uh, this is this is really very important to understand and many people many users are confused between the meaning of target and meaning of chromophore uh, in hair reduction the target is the hair follicle itself this is what we want to destroy in order to eliminate and decrease the regrowth of the hair chromophore is the melanin uh, in this case the hair follicle itself it is a colorless structure it doesn't have a color and any structure to be affected by the laser has to have a color this is the color is going to be what absorbs the laser and this is what we call chromophore so the target is the hair follicle the chromophore is the melanin another example the blood vessel when we are treating vascular lesions the target is the wall of the blood vessel the chromophore is the hemoglobin or oxyhemoglobin so the blood vessel wall doesn't have a color so we have to depend on a chromophore which is close by the the target in order to absorb the laser light convert it into heat and damage the intima of the blood vessel which we want to affect and damage <coughs> henna this is this is really very important and if we have uh, certain laser systems for treating blood vessels and those systems are having a contact cooling in this case if we are pressing the skin too much to the extent to the extent that um, uh, the, the blood vessel is squeezed too much the blood is going to get out so there is no chromophore we uh, we we fire the laser and there is no effect so we increase the energy because we didn't see effect on the blood vessel so no effect so increase the energy more to the extent that we can cause a scar and the blood vessel is not going to be affected so it's very important to understand that we have a chromophore and if this chromophore is not there we cannot get effect white hair cannot be affected by laser why because there is no chromophore so it's very important to understand the difference between a laser the, the chromophore and the target in our skin we have different chromophores we have the oxyhemoglobin which we target to treat vascular lesions we have the melanin which we uh, target in order to treat benign pigmented lesions and for hair reduction we have water which we target for rejuvenation and then we have exogenous chromophores which are the tattoo ink which we would like to affect in order to get rid of tattoos when we use the lasers the effects might be photothermal so we can generate heat out of that light and depending on the elevation in the temperature of the tissue then we get different photothermal effects we can get selective photothermalysis like in case of hair reduction if the heat was higher then we can get photocoagulation like what we do in order to treat uh, blood vessels or warts for example if the temperature rise was even higher above 100 degrees then we get vaporization and this is what we do with the ablative lasers so depending on the extent of the absorption and the temperature uh, uh, the heat generated we get different photothermal effects but those are the photothermal effects where we convert light into heat is this the only laser tissue interaction no we can got, get photomechanical effect so we are using the light in order to uh, cause a shock wave photoacoustic wave uh, photomechanical disruption with very high peak power the main effect is not thermal it's mechanical so we are causing very high peak power of a laser pulse which is causing explosion so that we are fragmenting the melanin particles in the pigmented lesion into small fragments or the ink into small fragments in the tattoo so that those small fragments will be removed by macrophages so this is photomechanical effect and the thermal effect here is minimal and then also we have photochemical effect where we are using the light or the laser in order to stimulate a chemical reaction in order to affect the tissue in a certain way and this is the base of using the photodynamic therapy so those are the different laser tissue interactions which we are uh, dealing with and which we are utilizing in different clinical applications. The selective laser absorption is one of the most uh, common application, which is the selective photothermolysis. And the point here is to emit a laser beam towards the skin. This laser beam should be able to penetrate uh, deep enough to reach the target. The target should be able to absorb that light 
and convert it into heat if it is a photothermal effect. And this heat should be confined to the target, selective to the target, so that the target is selectively affected without damaging the surrounding tissue. So this is the selective photothermolysis. So if we have a, a target like those two blood vessels, if you would like to affect them by laser, we aim a laser beam towards the skin, which should be blind for everything except its target. It shouldn't see anything in the skin except its target as much as possible. In order to do that, we have to get a wavelength which is highly absorbed by the chromophore of intention and less with the other chromophores. We should use the right energy, which is going to ensure that the heat generated is enough to achieve the effect you would like to get. If it is selective photothermolysis, then we need to get a certain temperature. If it is photocoagulation, it has to be higher. If it is vaporization, then we are selecting other wavelengths, which is having very high absorption by water. So the heat generated is going to be above, above the 100 degree Celsius. If we use too high energy, then this is going to be non-selective photothermolysis and the target is going to be damaged, but it's not going to be selectively damaged. Even the surrounding tissue are going to be damaged. This is something we don't want. Otherwise, instead of using the laser, use the cautery, uh, use something crude, get an iron. But to be selective, we have to use the right energy. But at the same time, if we use too low energy, then we are going to have another problem where either we don't get effect or we can get adverse effect. And instead of selective photothermolysis, we get photo by stimulation and people instead of reducing the hair will come back complaining of increased hair growth. So the uh, adjustment of the right energy is very important to get the optimum effect. And also the pulse duration is a very important parameter which we are going to discuss in the coming few slides. Uh, this is a small video which shows the selectivity of the laser. We have two balloons, a dark balloon inside a white balloon. The dark balloon is having the chromophore. It has the color which is going to be absorbing the laser. The white balloon is having no chromophore. So the laser will pass through the white balloon without affecting it. And then it's going to be absorbed by the black balloon. And we are going to see the impact on the black balloon only. Practically speaking, this is something we are seeing in the daily life when we are using lasers in the form of perifollicular edema and perifollicular erythema, where we can see that when we are doing hair removal, the effect of the laser is going to be confined to the hair follicles, and we can see that the skin in between is intact. It doesn't have erythema, it doesn't have edema, uh, whereas this effect is <coughs> confined to the hair follicles. And also, another example, that if you are using the laser, a hairy area, there will be a certain sense of heat and pain, whereas other areas which are not having hair will not show any pain with the same pulse, with the same wavelengths, with the same laser. So this shows the selectivity of the laser and this is the beauty of the laser. So the parameters uh, affecting the laser tissue interactions are the wavelengths, the fluence, the pulse duration, the spot size. And those are parameters which we need to be dynamic with according to the application, the density of the chromophore, the skin type, and so on. Uh, before we go to those parameters and how to uh, navigate, how to change those, it's important to answer those two questions regarding the wavelengths. What's the difference between the laser and the IPL? and how to select the wavelength. We have multiple options in many clinics now. We have more than one wavelength to achieve the same clinical application, hair removal. Do we use the diode or the alexandrite? Do we use IPL or laser? So it's important to, to answer those two questions. When it comes to the question about the difference between laser and light, laser is a light which is uh, characterized by being coherent, collimated, and monochromatic whereas the flashlight is non-coherent, non-collimated, and polychromatic. We know that, we read that, but sometimes we think that this is pure physics and it doesn't have any clinical importance. But if we understand the meaning of each term, we are going to understand why the laser is different than the IPL. Coherent means that uh, the beam of light which is composed of different waves traveling together, those waves are 
starting at the same point and ending at the same point. And this is going to create a waveform which is identical for all the waves composing that light beam. Any light beam is made of waves traveling together. So if those waves are starting together and ending together and having the same waveform, this is called coherence. This is called in phase. The physicists are calling this character in phase, which means that all the waves are in the same phase together at a time point. This is important because of the standardization, the quality control. When we are using coherent light, then each pulse is having exactly the same physical characters of the other pulses. So we have a degree of standardization. With IPL, uh, sometimes the, the effect is not very unique. We might have some pulses which are causing issues and uh, reactions different than the other pulses. It's not due to the fault of the operator. It is due to the fact that when we are using non-coherent light, the physical character of each pulse might be a little bit different. And those who use the IPL will tell you when I'm working on a full back or a thigh or a large body part, some pulses will do different effects. Some pulses will do great job, very nice clinical effect. Some others will cause some crust formation and scabbing and some others will do nothing. And they think that it is the fault of the operator. No, it is the non-coherent light, which is not very standardized like the laser. The other character of the laser is being collimated and collimated means that the waves are traveling parallel to each other. And that's why the laser beam can travel very long distance uh, with uh, very minimal divergence. And that's why they use the laser in the wars, in the laser guided missile, where they can aim a laser beam towards a target on the ground and the missile will follow that laser beam to its target and without deviation. Is this important practically in our field? Of course, because sometimes the target is deep. It is in the dermis, dermal pigmentation, deep hair follicle, large vessel, which is deep. So in this case, we need to convey enough amount of energy into the deeper layers of the skin. So the collimated uh, uh, character of the laser will allow it to penetrate deeper than an IPL. Finally, the laser is monochromatic. It is made of one single wavelength, uh, which is uh, having specific absorption by either more or less a single chromophore, like the pulse dye laser, which is mainly affecting the oxyhemoglobin, or the exandrite, which is mainly affecting the melanin, or sometimes we can choose, and this is our choice, to use a wavelength which can be absorbed by different chromophores in order to be able to exert multiple clinical applications, like the NDA laser. With the, with the IPL, it's polychromatic, and that's why the applications of the IPL are multiple. It's important to understand that. It doesn't mean that the IPL is uh, of no use. There is a lot of very good uses of IPL, but we need to understand the difference between lasers and IPL. I'm going to skip this. And now, uh, regarding the selection of the wavelength. Selecting the wavelength will depend on the absorption curves, which are having the different chromophores of the skin, the hemoglobin, the melanin, and the water. We have the different wavelengths, which we can use in different types of lasers. And then we have the absorption coefficient. So the higher we go, the, the higher the absorption is, and the lower we go, the less the absorption is. So in, in this case, we have to select uh, or choose what kind of laser we would like to use. If I'm treating melanin, if I'm treating hair reduction, then in this case, I would select a wavelength which is highly absorbed by the melanin with having uh, less absorption by hemoglobin and by water so that I'm selective to the melanin. But sometimes we might select to go for a wavelength which can be absorbed by melanin, by hemoglobin, and by water, like the 1064, the NDA, so that I'm able to do more than one application. But if I do that, I have to understand that there is higher risk because of the absorption by other chromophores. If I'm using the NDA for treating vessels, then I have risk that I can damage also the melanin. If this area is having hairs, then it can be affected and I can. Uh, cause hair reduction. Is this something desired or this is something undesired? All those are clinical situations which we need to understand and select and select the appropriate wavelength and appropriate laser type in order to get the optimum outcome with it. 
Uh, for hair reduction, for example, we have different types of lasers, like the ruby laser, like the xandrite laser, which are having high absorption by melanin. So they are used and they are very effective even when the hair becomes fine. However, they are not very safe when the skin becomes dark. So that's why the diode and the India lasers were introduced in order to address the dealing with darker skin types safely. And many people think that those lasers are confined and limited to the dark skin. No, whatever is safe in dark skin, it is going to be even safer in the finer skin, in the lighter skin. So diode and NDAG, they are safe in dark skin and they are safer in the light skin. But the problem with those lasers is that the absorption is less and that's why they are safe in dark skin. And this means that when the hair is becoming finer, the effect is going to diminish because finer hair will have less density of the chromophores and less density of the chromophores will be associated with less absorption. So the effect of those lasers on the fine hair will be weaker than the lasers which are highly uh, absorbed by the melanin. So this is something which we need to understand. When it comes to vascular lesions, we have lasers which are used for superficial vascular lesions like the pulse dye laser, also the KTP, the 532. And there are lasers which are more suitable for deep vascular lesion like the NDA because of the deep penetration. So the depth of penetration will allow the NDA to be more effective on deeper uh, vascular lesions, whereas lasers which are highly absorbed by the oxymoglobin will be used to treat superficial vascular lesions and they cannot penetrate deep enough to treat deep vascular lesions. The difference between the 532 and the 585 is that the 532, if we go back to the absorption curves, we are going to see that the 532 is highly absorbed by hemoglobin, but at the same time, very highly absorbed by melanin. So the selectivity is not there. And that's why the 532 is going to be a good wavelength to be used in treating vascular lesions only in skin types one and two. Once we try to treat darker skin types, uh, the safety is not going to be there. So we want to treat vessels, pigment will be affected and we get higher risk of hypo and hyperpigmentation. We want to treat epidermal pigmentation, even the blood vessels will be affected and we get texture changes. And that's why the 532 is not a very popular wavelength right now. For pigmented lesions, uh, we have different types of lasers. We have the Q-switched lasers, which can be used for treating both epidermal and dermal pigmentation. But we have lasers and light sources which can work only epidermal level, like the frequency doubled NDX 532, like the long pulse alexandrite and the IPL. Those are lasers which can work only on the epidermal pigmentation. We need the Q-switched lasers because they have mechanical effect. It's not only thermal effect and they can penetrate deep enough to target the dermal pigmentation as well as the epidermal ones. For resurfacing, we need to use lasers which are highly absorbed by water. Um, so that we can cause vaporization. And those are either the Urbe Miag laser 2940 or the carbon dioxide laser, the 10600. Uh, and we can see that the Urbeam is much higher in absorption than uh, in, in water than the CO2. And that's why it's more precise, more superficial. Uh, there is a very important rule in the laser, which is saying that the higher the absorption uh, of the wavelength, the less penetration it will have because it's going to be exhausted and consumed before it goes too much. And that's why the CO2 will penetrate deeper than the urban yag because it has less absorption. It's more effective, but also the downtime is much more. On the histo, uh, histological uh, aspect, they found that when we do ablation with the CO2, after the ablation zone, there is a thermal residue of about 150 microns in the tissue because of the uh, heat distribution because of the less efficient absorption of the CO2 by water. Whereas with the erbium, after the ablation zone, we, got, we get only 15 microns of thermal zone. And that's why the CO2 is more effective than the erbium yag, but also it's associated with higher uh, incidence of side effects, prolonged erythema, higher incidence of uh, pigmentary issues. And that's why now with the erbium yag, they have a longer pulse erbium yag, uh, in order to be able to modulate the pulse duration and get the thermal effect required. Sometimes we need the effect of the urban yag, 
uh, like ablating a superficial layer of the skin, like freckles, for example. But sometimes we need the effect of the CO2 in order to be having the thermal effect like in acne scars. So it's good to have uh, the flexibility in selecting the pulse duration to be able to get different thermal effects. It's not only the wavelength. For non-ablative rejuvenation, in order to uh, improve the texture of the skin, in order to improve the pore size, in order to improve the acne scars, we have different issues with the aging, like pigmented lesions, like fine lines and wrinkles, large pores, sometimes photo damage, telangiectasia, spina veins, and sometimes even we have unwanted terminal hair. And because of that, in many cases, aging skin might need more than one laser system, one wavelength. We need different wavelengths in order to be able to affect the different chromophores. So this is regarding the wavelengths and the selection of the wavelengths. What about the fluence? There are so many things which affect how we should determine the fluence. Like what is the aim of the laser treatment? What is the application we are using? What is the wavelength we are using? And what's the target size? And finally, the skin colors. All those are questions which the, with the answer of those questions will determine the appropriate range for selecting the fluents. When it comes to the aim, if you would like to get photo bias stimulation, then low fluence will do the job. We don't need high temperature rise. However, if we need to do selective phototermolysis, then we need high fluence in order to destroy. We need to destroy a target. So we need the high fluence. If we are doing photodynamic therapy, it's a chemical reaction using the light. So in this case, low fluence will be enough. Depending on the application, I might use the 1064 NDAG laser. And if I'm using that for rejuvenation, then I would like to get photo bias stimulation. So in this case, 12 to 15 joule per centimeter squared is going to be enough. If I want to achieve hair reduction, then, then this is selective photothermolysis. So a range between 25 to 50 joules will be the appropriate range for hair reduction. The same wavelength, the 1064, if I'm using it for vascular lesions, then the effect here is photocoagulation. And in this case, I need to use higher fluence between 80 and 160. This is a big range. So again, within that range, within that application, within that wavelength, there is a room to move, when to go up, when to go down. This will depend on other factors which we'll discuss. We might do hair reduction on my hand with that skin type, with that hair. But if I'm using NDAG, I would use 25 to 50 joules. If I'm using diode, then I would use 20 to 40 joules. Of course, this is with the regular diode. If we have uh, the, the vacuum assisted diode lasers, then the fluence is going to be much less because there are other factors and the, the delivery of the laser is going to be less. But I'm talking about the regular diode. If I'm using Alexandrite, then I use 12 to 20 joule per centimeter square. It is the same patient, it's the same type of hair, it's the same type of skin. But depending on the wavelength, I have different range of fluence. Now, a very important question, why with the Alexandrite, I would need much less fluence than with the NDX, for example, because the absorption of the melanin to the Alexandrite is much more, it's higher than the NDX. So because the absorption is high, I need less fluence than the NDX, which is less in absorption. And that's why we need higher fluence with the NDX. Target size is very important. If I'm treating thick hair, then the target is large, the chromophore density is high, so low, low fluence will do the job. However, with small targets, I need higher fluence to compensate for the less absorption. Thick hair will need less fluence than fine hair. Large vessel will need less fluence than uh, uh, small vessel. Uh, tattoo, which is dark, not treated before, will need less fluence than if the tattoo is faded or after a few sessions when the color becomes faint. This is very important because if I use high fluence when the target chromophore density is high, I'm going to damage the surrounding tissue. This is going to be non-selective photothermolysis. And if I use low fluence when the target density is low, I might cause photo bias stimulation instead of selective photothermolysis. So it's really very important to keep in mind that the target size will determine the right fluence, otherwise there will be an unsatisfactory outcome. Skin type, if I'm doing laser assist hair reduction, then in dark skin, I have to reduce uh, 
I have to reduce the fluence. If I'm treating fair skin, I can increase the fluence if required. It is not necessary to start with high fluence from the beginning. If I have patient who is having thick hair and uh, uh, the skin is fair, I would use low fluence to reduce the pain, to reduce any risk of damaging the skin, burn, and so on. However, when the hair is becoming fine in fair skin, I have the free hand to increase the fluence without any risk, without any fears. Uh, this is not the case in dark skin. On the other hand, in vascular lesions, in fair skin, we have to use less fluence because uh, the, the, uh, the fair skin is going to have much deeper depth of penetration of the laser. In dark skin, we have some filtration by the melanin. So the laser cannot penetrate deep as much as in fair skin. So if you use high fluence in treating vascular lesions in fair skin, the incidence of scarring is going to be high. So that's, we have to reduce the fluence. So uh, this was regarding the fluence. Um, I don't know if we uh, need to uh, stop here to uh, answer any questions or shall we continue? Dr. Shadi, please let me know if we should proceed or uh, we, we can pause here. Dr. Shadi, you are muted. Dr. Ashraf, can you continue the question? Continue. Oh. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So, pulse duration is uh, uh, one of the very important uh, uh, points which we need to understand well. And the mining, the pulse duration will depend on something called thermal relaxation time. What is the thermal relaxation time? By definition, it's the time necessary for the target to cool down 50% through the transfer of its heat to the surrounding tissue via thermal diffusion. This seems to be a bit complicated, but let us explain that. If I'm exposing a certain chromophore to the laser, with the beginning of the laser pulse, the temperature of that chromophore is going to increase to a certain extent till we reach the maximum. And then at that point, this chromophore is going to start to radiate and spread the heat to the surrounding tissue. When that happens, the temperature of that chromophore will start to decline. When it reaches 50% of the maximum heat, this time here is called the thermal relaxation time for that particular chromophore. So the thermal relaxation time is the time required by the target to lose 50% of the acquired heat by diffusing the heat to the surrounding tissue. Why this is important? Because before we reach the thermal relaxation time, the target or the chromophore is containing more than 50% of the heat of the laser pulse. So we are going to affect that chromophore. However, after the thermal exchange time, this chromophore had the chance to thermally relax, has the chance to diffuse more than 50% of the heat to the surrounding tissue. So if we want to affect a target, if we want our laser pulse to affect a target, then we have to use a pulse duration shorter than the thermal exchange time so that the temperature is going to be above 50% 50, 50 confined to the target. If we don't want the laser to affect a certain target, like for example, the epidermal melanin in hair removal, we don't want to damage the epidermal melanin. So in this case, we are using a pulse duration longer than the thermal exchange time of the epidermal melanin so that the temperature will go down and the epidermal melanin will diffuse the heat uh, to the surrounding tissue and will not be affected. So this is the thermal exchange time. The thermal exchange time uh, is dependent on the size of the chromophore. So epidermal melanin, there are small structures, will have short thermal exchange time. Fo uh, follicle, hair follicle melanin is large, so they have longer thermal exchange time. So epidermal melanin will have three to 10 milliseconds thermal exchange time. The hair follicle melanin will have 40 to 100 milliseconds. If I don't want to damage the epidermal melanin, then I have to give a pulse duration above the thermal exchange time, so it has to be above 10. And if I want to affect the hair follicle melanin, then the pulse duration has to be shorter than the thermal exchange time, shorter than 40. So the ideal range for hair removal will be above 10 milliseconds and less than 40 milliseconds. This is the ideal range for hair removal. If I use shorter pulse duration than 10, I have risk of epidermal damage, and in this case, I have to use very good cooling, otherwise I can damage the epidermal melanin, 
And if I use much longer pulse duration than 40 milliseconds, then I have risk of ineffective treatment. So this is the ideal range for hair reduction, above 10 and below 40 milliseconds. Even for treating blood vessels, because we might be dealing with different size of blood vessels, microvasculature like non-ablative rejuvenation uh, or fine telangiectasia or spider veins or reticular leg veins. So the larger the vessel, the longer the pulse duration. So in micro vessels, 0.3 to 0.6 millisecond will do a great job in non-ablative rejuvenation because it can target the micro vessels. For fine, fine telangiectasia, I need 10 to 20 millisecond pulse duration. For spider veins, we need 20 to 30 milliseconds. For reticular veins, we might need up to 40 milliseconds. We can see that the larger the chromophore, the longer the thermal exchange time, so I have to use a longer pulse duration in order to be able to affect that target without affecting the other chromophores. If I use the laser to treat spider veins, it is more appropriate to use 20 to 30 milliseconds than 10, because if I use 10, I can affect smaller vessels which are superficial, which are not my target. And that's why I have to use 20 milliseconds so that I am using a thermal excision time, uh, a pulse duration longer than the thermal excision time of these small vessels, and at the same time shorter than that large vessel. And that's why it's very important to understand the thermal excision time of the target chromophore and that of the competing chromophore, so that I'm using a longer pulse duration than the chromophore I don't want to affect, and shorter than the film exchange time of the chromophore I would like to affect. I hope this is clear, because this is a very important point. Spot size is uh, the, the, uh, another very important uh, parameter. So we know that the larger spot size would penetrate deeper. So if I have a deep, structure, deep target, then I have to use a larger spot size to penetrate deeper enough to damage the target. However, if I'm using the laser to treat targets which are superficial, it doesn't make sense to use larger spot size because larger spot size will be associated with deeper penetration. Deeper penetration means more pain and patient is going to be uh, in pain without any additional benefit. So if you are treating the hair in the upper lip. The hair follicles in this area is not very deep and it doesn't make sense to use very large spot size 15 or 20 because this is not going to help in improving the results and it's going to be associated with pain. It makes sense, better sense to use seven or 10 millimeter spot which is going to have enough depth of penetration without any more pain. If the hair follicles are deep, then at that time we need to use a larger spot size. Another uh, very interesting uh, thing, which is here, uh, if I'm using five millimeter spot, then the relative area is 0.5. If I use seven, it becomes one. 10, relative area is two. So the 10 millimeter spot is covering four times more than the five. It's not two times more. <coughs> so the coverage here is very important. And that's why when we are using larger spot size, of course, we are having better speed because the coverage is going to be much better, but we have to keep in mind that larger spot size, deeper penetration, more pain. Overlapping should be in the range of 10 to 30%, between 10% to 30% according to the type of laser you are using. Some of the lasers are having Gaussian beam. In this case, we need 30% overlap. Some of the lasers are having flat top beam. In this case, 10% is enough. If you are using flat top beam and you did 30% overlap, you are increasing the risk of complications and too much overlap and hyperpigmentation, crust, and scab formation. If you used 10% only overlap in a Gaussian beam profile, then you can have risk of skipping some areas. And this is the honeycomb appearance, which we want to avoid if possible. So it's very important to know if your laser is having Gaussian beam, or flat beam profile so that you adjust the overlap between 10% to 30% according to that. This was an, a poor overlap. So we can so see that some areas were treated and some areas were skipped. This was no overlap at all. So this is something we want to avoid. We need to have more homogeneous application of the laser with the appropriate overlap. 
Finally, the last uh, thing before we stop, we, before we end this presentation is the skin cooling. We have uh, contact cooling where we can use ice cubes or ice packs or ice gel. We can use cold conductors like chill tip handpiece, metal cooling fingers or sapphire lens like the diode uh, laser, for example. And we have the non-contact cooling using cold air or cryogen spray. There are many debates about if it is better to use cold cooling or uh, contact cooling or non-contact cooling, if it's better to use cold air cooling or cryogen sprays. Uh, all those are areas of discussion which we can discuss during the presentation. Uh, before I end, there are a few important uh, uh, practical points which you are always uh, uh, asked about, like, for example, using the lasers in pregnancy. Uh, I discussed in the beginning that laser is non ionized radiation. Um, from the theoretical point of view, it has limited depth of penetration into the skin. It has a specific targets uh, and chromophores which absorb it. Uh, uh, so we don't have theoretically any risk for inducing any damage or any problem to the baby. Um, so theoretically, it is safe. However, practically speaking, we don't like to treat pregnant women because of several factors. One of them is if there is pre-existing congenital anomaly and you use the laser during the pregnancy, the mother or the family might think that this is caused by the laser. So this is a medical legal issue. So we don't want to do that. During pregnancy, there is increased production of nanocytes stimulating hormone. So the incidence of hyperpigmentation uh, during the pregnancy is going to be higher than without pregnancy. And this is not linked to the laser. Only any, dam any injury to the skin will be associated with higher incidence of hyperpigmentation during the pregnancy because of the nanocytes stimulating hormone. There are some acupuncture points in the skin, which we are not aware of. Stimulating those points can lead to uterine contractions and abortions. And there are a few case reports of abortion in the first trimester after laser treatment. We don't want to get that. And also pain. When we are treating large areas of the body, uh, pain might lead to uh, uterine contractions and abortion. And that's why we don't prefer to treat pregnant women. Uh, what about the operator? If the physician is pregnant or if the technician, the nurse, whoever is working with the laser is pregnant, is there any risk? Of course, there is no risk at all. It is non-ionized gradation and it doesn't carry any kind of risk. Um, is laser carcinogenic or no? Uh, again, it's non-ionized gradation. We don't have risk. However, if we are treating an area which is having melanocytic nevus, we have to examine it very well. We have to make sure that it is not a suspicious lesion. And if there is any uh, suspicion about it, we should never touch it with laser. Also, large tattoos like this, uh, when we are using the Q-switched lasers, we are going to fragment the ink particles and they are going to be uh, going by the macrophages to the lymph nodes. The regional lymph nodes might have a, a reaction it can be to the extent of foreign body, body granuloma. But more importantly, there is a recent article which was published, which claimed that there were about 19 people who developed melanoma after Q-switched laser treatment for their tattoos. But carefully reviewing this paper, we are going to realize that those people, those patients, did not develop the melanoma due to the laser treatment. They actually had melanoma or early signs of melanoma, which was masked by the tattoo, and it was not diagnosed, and then it developed. So, but the laser was involved. And that's why I always stress on the fact that it is very important that laser treatment should be under medical supervision, and dermatologists should be uh, examining the skin very well to, uh, to, to make sure that there are no signs of malignancy or any suspicious uh, lesions on the skin before we use the laser. Uh, uh, this, is, this is really very important. Of course, when we have a patient who is having tattoo like that, it is not easy because it is covering the skin. However, uh, whenever we are treating tattoos, it's really very important to pay very good attention and examine the skin very well to exclude that we have any signs of any suspicious lesion on the skin, especially if it is fair skin where the risk of melanoma is going to be higher. The last thing before I end this presentation is the comparative study because <coughs> there are many comparative studies 
which are comparing different types of laser and they are claiming that this type of laser is having better hair reduction than that kind of laser. However, sometimes if you look at the uh, structure of the study, it is not well structured. In order to be able to come up with accurate comparative studies, it has to be on the same patient, uh, identical regions. So I cannot compare 30 patients treated with diode laser with another 30 patient treated with alexandrite laser, for example, and compare. It has to be on the same patient, one side of the face treated with one laser, another side of the face treated with another laser in order to come up with uh, good data. Otherwise, there are so many personal variations. I cannot compare 30 patients treated with the, on the face with another 30 patients treated with the legs. It's completely different one region to another. So it's really very important to be the same patient, the same anatomical region, uh, hopefully the same day, which is again difficult because if I use the NDAG laser, for example, the emission in between the sessions might be longer than if I'm using IPL or Alexandrite. So the same day, one side will be having regrowth of hair, the other side will not be having the same. So sometimes it's really very challenging. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I know that we took a bit longer time than expected, but now I think uh, Dr. Shadi and Dr. Abir can uh, uh, go for some questions and answers.
ان ناس كتير من بلاد عربيه كمان شايفين المحاضره مبسوطين بيها جدا من ليبيا ومن الكويت ناس كتير بتقول ازاي انها لاول مره يفهموا الليزر فيزكس الصوت الصوت مش واضح يا دكتور عبير في حاجه في الصوت يا كنترول روم بليز الصوت مش واضح يا دكتور عبير الساوند از تو لو بتاع الدكتور عبير تمام اه اه كده تمام كده تمام تمام كده كده احسن يا دكتور اشرف اه تمام ممتاز بقول لك يا دكتور اشرف الكومنتس اللي جايه كلها ناس مبسوطه جدا جدا من المحاضره ناس من ليبيا ومن الكويت شافونا ومبسوطين قوي قوي ناس بتقول قد ايه المحاضره انفورمتيف وقد ايه هم اول مره يفهموا الليزر فيزكس ويفهموا البيزكس ودي نقطه في منتهى الاهميه يعني كميه الكومنتس اللي جايه شكر في المحاضره جدا جدا محاضره رائعه فعلا يعني احنا حابين نجمع لك الاسئله اللي انا حابب بس قبل ما نكمل دكتور عبير ان انا حابب اشكر السبونسرنج كمبانيز الحقيقه يعني من غير السبورت بتاعهم ات ووز نوت بوسيبل تو كوندكت ذات وحابب اشكر دكتور عاصم فرج وشارب ديرما تو ارينج ذات الحقيقه مجهود كبير واي ريلي ابريشيت ات فمتشكر جدا وكمان بشكر الحضور يعني في يوم جمعه والاجازه وكده يعني ان هم موجودين معانا وطبعا بشكر الدكتور عبير والدكتور شادي ان هم ادونا الوقت ده ووجودهم معانا يعني غالي جدا عندي فاي ريلي ابريشيت يور ايفورتس حقيقي احنا احنا اللي بنشكرك يا دكتور اشرف حقيقي محاضره ممتعه فعلا واللي بسمع الحاجه 100 مره ودايما بقول لكل الناس اللي علمني الليزر الدكتور اشرف العفو العفو يا دكتور العفو في اسئله كثيره كلها بتلف حوالين الهير ريدكشن آه زي مثلا بيقولوا انه هل ينفع نستخدم الايزوتريتينين واحنا بنعمل هير ريدكشن؟ ده سؤال مهم جدا وهايل آه ودايما بقول يا دكاتره آه احنا محتاجين ان احنا نكون فنانين آه احنا فضلنا فتره طويله جدا نقول ان الايزوتريتينين والروكيوتان ما ينفعش ان احنا آه يعني نستخدم الليزر اثناء العلاج بيه وفضلنا فتره طويله نقول لازم نستنى ست شهور وبعد كده رجعت الست شهور دي تقل شويه لثلاث شهور وبعد كده لشهر واخيرا في اليوروبيان اكاديمي اوف درماتولوجي they released a, a review of literature و uh, recommendations اللي بتقول انه الليزر هير ريموفل والمايكرو نيدلنج والمايكرو نيدلنج ريدي فريكونسي والفراكشنال ليزرز ولسته كبيره من الابلكيشنز اللي احنا نقدر ان احنا نبقى تو uh, شير البيبر دي لو حبيته السيف during the concomitant treatment with isotretinoin كويس؟ يعني احنا عندنا دلوقتي دوكيمنت بيقول ان doing the hair removal والحاجات البروسيجرز التانية is safe هل انا هاخد هذه المعلومة وابتدي ان انا اشتغل بقى وخلاص انا عندي بقى حاجة to support اللي انا بعمله ولا ابتدي ان انا اشتغل او افكر بصورة clinical وصورة practical أنا دايماً بحب إن إحنا تو أناليز، أي كان نوت تيك ثينكس بلايندلي وأتصرف عليها بدون ما إعمال العقل. خلينا ناخد ستيب باك. دكتور عبير ودكتور شادي قولوا لنا لو سمحتوا هو إحنا لما بيبقى في مريض بياخد أيزوتريتينين إحنا بنخاف من إيه؟ إيه المشاكل اللي إحنا بنخاف منها ونبتدي نقول هو إحنا نعمل ليزر ولا ما نعملش ليزر؟ هو إحنا نعمل سيرجري ولا ما نعملش سيرجري؟ إيه المشاكل اللي بتحصل مع الأيزوتريتينين؟ الهيلنج يا دكتور اشرف حلو واحده واحده الهيلنج لا واحده واحده خلينا نمسكهم واحده واحده الهيلنج يبقى انا لما بقيم بروسيجر انا بعمله سواء هو ليزر ولا كرايو سيرجري ولا اي بروسيجر الديرماتولوجي بيعمله كوتري لازم اسال نفسي هو البروسيجر اللي انا بعمله ده هيعمل ووند وبالتالي ابقى خايف من البروسيس بتاعت الهيلنج ولا لا الهير ريموفل بيعمل ووند لا ما بيعملش ما بيعملش وند كويس يبقى انا مش خايف من الحكايه دي هخاف منه في حاله واحده لو انا كنت تو اجريسيف لو ان انا لسه ببتدي البراكتس بتاع الليزر ومش متاكد من البارامترز الصح واستخدمت حاجه تو اجريسيف عملت وند يبقى هبقى خايف من الهيلنج فلو حد بيبتدي يبقى ما يعملش لحد عنده بياخد ايزوتريتينوين لان انا لو فرض ان انا استخدمت حاجه غلط وعملت وند يمكن يبقى في مشكله في الهيلنج انما لو حد اكسبيرينس وبيعمل هير ريموفل ذيس از نوت ا كونسيرن يبقى دي ما هياش حاجه هشغل بالي بيها خالص ف... وانا بعمل هير ريموفل صح؟ تمام ادي الموضوع بتاع الهيلنج ايه المشكله الثانيه؟ 
ايه <تصفيق> 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 لو البروسيجر اللي انا بعمله بيعمل ووند في واحد عنده فوتو سنسيفيتي بسبب الايزو 39 وما استخدمش سان بلوك هيحصل له هايبر بيجمنتيشن بانسيدنس اعلى صح؟ تمام يبقى دي النقطه الثانيه مع الايزو 39 النقطه الثالثه ان الايزو 39 بيسبب دراينس اوف ذا سكين واحنا عارفين ان الدراي سكين الرياكشن بتاعه للليزر از مور اجريسيف ننسى الايزو 39 لو بنعمل هير ريموفال لحد الجلد بتاعه دراي ايه اللي بيحصل؟ ما ده اكتر ناس جلدهم بيتحرق صح؟ صحيح واكتر ناس بيحصل لهم سكاب فورميشن بغض النظر عن الايزو تريتنوين يبقى اذا لو العيان على ايزو تريتنوين او ما هواش على ايزو تريتنوين لو جيت اعمل هير ريموفال ولقيت الجلد فيري دراي اي هاف تو يوز كلينزنج ميلك او اي هاف تو هايدريت ذا سكين شويه قبل ما اعمل الليزر عشان يبقى الليزر تيشو انتر اكشن مايلد نوت اجريسيف دول البوينتس اللي انا محتاج ان انا احطهم في الاعتبار وبالتالي اي كان نوت تيك ات granted ان سيف مع الايزوترينون زي ما البيبرز بتقول ولا ان انا اقول ان هو لازم استنى ست شهور الكونديشنز دي موجوده البروسيجر اللي انا بعمله ابليتيف ولا انا ابليتيف هيسبب لي ووند ولا مش هيسبب ووند جلد دراي ولا ما هوش دراي از لونج از اي انديرستاند دوس ايشوز مش محتاج بقى ان انا ابقى بقول احط رولز سوليد ويز اوت ثينكينج داز ذا ذا كويشن اه في نفس النقطه هو بيقول طيب ما هو الفراكشنال مايكرو تشانلز صغيره يعتبر وونت صغير صح دي تمثل مشكله برضه مع الايزو آه ما هو الايزو تريتمون الستاديز اللي هي اللي انا بتكلم عليها كمان شككت في قصه ان الهيلينج بيبقى امبيرد يعني حتى عملوا ترايلز في ناس اتعمل لهم عمليات وذي ستاديد هيستولوجيكالي الهيلينج اوف وونز ولقوا ان هو ما بيحصلش اي مشكله في الهيلينج بتاع الوونز فبالتالي it is not an issue لان ال impairment of wound healing طلع ان هو تخوف اكثر منه حقيقه والفكره بس ان during the healing process لو المايكرو تشانلز اللي احنا بنعملها بالمايكرو نيلينج ريد فريكونسي هتبقى في الفيس والعيان ده مش بيستخدم سان سكرين كويس احتمال ان يحصل له مكانها هايبر بيجمنتيشن لان في healing process المايكرو نيلينج مختلف عن المايكرو نيلينج ريد فريكونسي مختلف عن الفراكشنال ليزر والفراكشنال ليزر الابليتيف مختلف عن النون ابليتيف فالدامج اللي انا بعمله هو اللي هيديني انسر على الكويشن لو انا بعمل مايكرو نيدلنج مفيش حراره وفي خلال 90 دقيقه السكين هيقفل يبقى ما عنديش ريسك اوف هايبر بيجمنتيشن حتى لو العيان عنده فوتو سنسيفيتي صح المايكرو نيدلنج دي فريكونسي زي وزي النون ابليتيف فراكشنال انا ما عنديش حاجه قوي ديستراكشن ديستراكشن للابيديرمس ففي الحاله دي القصه بتاعه الهايبر بيجمنتيشن از نوت ان ايشو السؤال بس يا دكتور شادي ان الحاجات البروسيجرز اللي هي بتعمل استيميليشن للكولاجين زي المايكرو نيدلنج والمايكرو نيدلنج فريكونسي والفراكشنال ليزرز ابليتيف اور نون ابليتيف هل الكولاجين استيميليشن ديورينج ذا ايزو تريتينون تريتمنت هيبقى از افكتيف از اواي فروم ذا ايزو تريتينون تريتمنت ذس از سمثينج ويتش واز نوت ستاديد وانا ما عنديش انسر ليها معرفش بس اذا في واحد بياخد ايزو 39 علشان اي سبب اكتف اكني اور وات ايفر يعني اعتقد ان احنا نستنى لما الاكتف اكني سبسايد وبعد كده خلاص نوقف الايزو 39 وساعتها نبتدي نعمل البروسيجرز بتاعه الاستيميليشن اوف كولج ما حبكش ديورينج ذات تايم لان انا اخشى انه يبقى الاستيميليشن اوف كولج يبقى اضعف من لو استنينا شويه ان شاء الله حتى شهر بعد ما نوقف الايزو 39 This is my opinion. I'm not sure if the procedure and to charge the patient something, while I'm not sure if the effect is going to happen or not. You are muted, yeah, Doctor Shadi. If you allow me to unmute, okay. 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 Okay
تكتشر او السكنس او حتى الموستيرايزيشن بتاع الهايدريشن بتاع الجلد بيفرق معايا في السكاترنج طبعا يعني ده بيخليني ان انا اغير الاستيتي بتاعتي وانا شغال 100% 100% في ستاديز قالت ان السكن اللي بري تريتد باي ريتينول باي مايكروديرم ابريشن باي كيميكال بيلينج بيبقى الهايبر كيراتوزس اقل وبالتالي الاوبتيكال بنتريشن بيبقى افضل وبالتالي في الحاله دي لس فلوينس لس انرجي مايت جيت ايفن بيتر ريزلتس وكل ما احنا قادرين ان احنا نقلل الانرجي اللي احنا بنستخدمها وفي نفس الوقت ما نقللش الافكتفنس كل ما يبقى افضل البين هيبقى اقل والسايد افكتس هتبقى اقل عشان كده الميني procedures of rejuvenation and I prefer ان انا احضر الجلد قبلها سواء بالمايكروديرم ابريشن او باستخدام ريتينول قبلها وهكذا لان ده بيقلل الهايبر كيراتوزس والاوبتيكال بنتريشن هيبقى افضل. لما بنستخدم لما بنشيل الميك اب والسيبم والسوات ده بيخلي الاوبتيكال بنتريشن بتاع الليزر هيبقى افضل وهكذا ف this is this is very important point طبعا. طيب في سؤال بيقول ان لو عيان وبيجي له او واحده بتعمل هير ريدكشن او وات ايفر من البروسيجرز على الليزر وبيجي لها سيزرز مثلا أوه. فهل كونفالجنس هل ايه اللي المفروض نعمله لو احنا هنشتغل لها؟ هو طبعا هنا الميديكال هيستوري مهم وكان زمان بنقرا انه الابيلابسي والابيلابتيك فيتس ار ا كونترا انديكيشن فور ذا ليزر صح؟ نرجع تاني ونقول ان في اكتر من فاكتور هنا لازم يتاخدوا في الاعتبار. If the epilepsy is controlled يبقى غالبا ما عندناش مشكله. If في active fits بتيجي يبقى we have to be careful. نمره اتنين اللي بيعمل stimulation لل fits هل هو الفوتو stimulation هاو هو اللايك يعني في بعض ال patients بتوع الابيلابسي لو اتعرض ل pain ممكن يدخل في fit. في ناس ثانيه وده المور كومن ان strong lights A strong emission of light هو اللي كان precipitate a fit. So if we are using an infrared laser, if we are using MDAG laser or diode laser, it is not not visible. في الحالة دي there is no risk if it is the the light stimulation هو اللي بيعمل الفيت. فإنما لو بنستخدم Alexandrite laser or IPL or KTP laser or pulse dye laser, definitely we can have a risk if the patient is not controlled. تمام. ترى شادي في سؤال. دكتور اشرف في برضه يعني في اسئله كتير قوي على ريجاردنج السيرفر ريداكشن تايم برضه في واضح ان مش مفهومه البوينت دي فانا هسالك بشكل مختلف شويه في فرق بين السيرفر ريداكشن تايم اند السيرفر دامج تايم هو الثيرمال دامج تايم هو البيك يعني لو احنا وصلنا لل 100% ذس از ذا ثيرمال دامج تايم الثيرماكشن تايم هو اضعف الايمان الثيرماكشن تايم ده الوقت اللي هو بيبقى التارجت هيبتدي وصل ل 50% من فقد للحراره، يعني احنا دلوقتي لو التارجت اللي احنا بنعرضه للليزر ده ابتدى حرارته ترتفع مع البلس وبعدين ابتدى ان هو يوزع الحراره اللي حواليه فدرجه حرارته تنخفض. عند الثيرماكشن تايم بيبقى فقد 50%، قبلها بيبقى محتفظ ب 50% او اكثر من الحراره. بعدها بيبقى فقد اكثر من 50%. فعلشان كده احنا بنبقى اضعف الايمان ان انا اخلي ان التارجت اللي انا عايز استهدفه يحتفظ على الاقل 50% من الحراره. لو ما قدرتش اعمل كده يبقى التارجت هيفقد الحراره وهيبقى التريتمنت بتاعي مش فيري افكتف. الثيرمال دامج تايم ده ان انا اوصل بقى لل 100% بس للاسف ذيس ووز نوت استيميتد ما قدروش ان هم يقيسوها اللي عرفوا ان هو يقيسوه هو الثيرمال اكسشن تايم وده اضعف الايمان ده اللي احنا شغالين عليه طيب في حد بيسال على ليه العيان البيشنس ما تبقاش ساتيسفايد حتى لو عملت 20 سيشنز اوف ليزر هير ريدكشن وده تقول انا مش حاسه ان ده يعني الاند بوينت بتاعتي او لازم الدكتور يقف يقول لها خلاص مش هعمل تاني بعد كده ليزر هير ريدكشن لان احنا عارفين ان طبعا ان هو 80% بس امبروفمنت فهو بيسالوا السؤال ده ازاي تو كونفنس البيشنس ازاي يقولوا للبيشنس دي الاند بوينت بتاعتك مش هتاخد طيب. التحسن اكتر من كده طيب خلينا نتفق ان الاف دي اي اول ما ابتدت تدي ابروفال كانت بتدي ابروفال على بيرمننت هير ريموفال وكانت المفارقه العجيبه ان البيرمننت هير ريموفال ده خدوا جهاز 
كي سويتشد اندياج مع كربون سسبنشن وبعدين بعد شويه اكتشفوا ان ما فيش حاجه اسمها بيرمننت هير ريموفال فغيروا المسمى من بيرمننت هير ريموفال الى بيرمننت هير ريدكشن والمفاجاه ان هم اكتشفوا ان هذه الطريقه الاولى اللي هي الكي سويتشد اندياج مع كربون سسبنشن ولا حتى كمان بتعمل هير ريدكشن دي بتعمل تيمبوري سبريشن اوف ذا هير جروث وبعد كده يبتدي يحصل تاني هير جروث الحاجات التانية بتدي ريدكشن اوف اباوت 70 تو 80% من ناحية العدد بتاع الهير فوليكلز ومن ناحية الثيكنس بتاع الهير وكمان المعدل بتاع الريجروث وبنقول ان احنا محتاجين عدد من الجلسات بيختلف من شخص لشخص وبيختلف من مكان لمكان في الجسم افريج بتاعهم ممكن يكون خمس لسبع جلسات اللي بعدهم الشعر بيقل بنسبة 70 ل 80% ولكن عشان نحافظ على الكلام ده محتاجين ان احنا نعيد الجلسات عدة مرات في السنة يمكن مرتين او ثلاثة في السنة عشان تو كيب ذا نمبر ذا هير ريديوسد. امتى نتوقف عن الجلسات؟ لما يبتدي الشعر يصل الى ان هو فاين هير فاين فيلاس هير داز نوت هاف كلر لان الشعراية لازم يكون فيها كلر عشان تمتص الليزر، الشعر الفيلاس It is not going to respond. الحاجة الثانية كمان إن إحنا في وقت من الأوقات لو عندنا جهاز مش قادرين نتحكم قوي في البالس ديوريشن irrespective of the fluence I might tell the patient خلاص يعني جرب وسيلة ثانية غير الليزر otherwise we can induce paradoxical hair growth. الحاجة الأخيرة اللي أنا عايز أقولها إنه ساعات إحنا كأطباء محتاجين نفهم البيشنس إن إحنا من لطف ربنا وكرمه علينا إن إحنا we cannot get permanent hair removal ليه بقى؟ لأن الهير فوليكل دي موجود فيها stem cells والstem cells زي مسؤولة عن إن الشعر يرجع ينمو تاني مسؤولة كمان عن healing of the wounds of the skin لو كنا احنا قادرين ان احنا نعمل complete destruction of the hair follicle كنا هنعمله عن طريق ان احنا بنعمل complete destruction of the stem cells وساعتها كان هيبقى الجلد اللي قدرنا ان احنا نشيل منه الشعر بالكامل هيبقى فيه مشكلة في الهيلينج بتاعه لما يبقى عندهم wound it is going to take much longer time to heal فده من فضل ربنا ان احنا we are unable to damage all the hair follicles لان its presence is a very important factor for healing of the skin because of the stem cells فدي حاجه انا بوضحها للبيشنس ان ما تزعلوش ان احنا ما بنشيلش شعر خالص لان ده من صحه الجلد وكل حاجه ربنا خالقها بقدر فالتدخل زياده عن اللزوم في خلق الله لازم هيبقى معاه بعض النيجاتيف اسبكتس سؤال يا دكتور اشرف ريجاردنج الكولينج يعني احنا حضرتك ايه النوع انت حضرتك بتفضله دي حاجة حاجة تانية كان الكولينج افكت الفلونس الناس اللي بتعلي مثلا درجات من درجات الاير كول الكولينج بتاعنا درجة عالية جدا وهو شغال ده بيليمت الفلونس وانا شغال تمام ده ده سؤال مهم قوي اولا بالنسبة لانواع الكولينج فعايز اقول بس ان احنا دلوقتي انواع اللي فيها كونتاكت كولينج بالذات في الايرا اللي احنا فيها دلوقتي مع البانديميك بتاع كورونا وده هنتكلم على القصه دي اكتر يمكن في المحاضره الثانيه بتاعه الليزر سيفتي ولكن النون كونتاكت كولينج هيبقى انا دايما كنت بقول حتى قبل القصه بتاعه الكورونا ان فروم ذا هايجين بوينت اوف فيو اتس ا ماتش بيتر واي لان في بعض الاجهزه بتاعه الكونتاكت كولينج ما هياش زي اجهزه ثانيه اللي فيها ديسبوزبل تيب ويتغير مع كل بيشنت هو الهاند بيس بتاعه الليزر هي اللي بنستخدمها في كل حته في الجسم بتاع البيشنت وان بيتوين ذا بيشنتس وإذا ما كناش بننتبه إن إحنا uh, we have to clean the hand piece in between the patients from the hygiene point of view is not good وطبعا في case reports of some people uh, who got uh, infected by human papilloma virus worse after doing hair removal in a clinic وده جه definitely من contact cooling اللي بيبقى uh, الهايجين مش مش كويس قوي وكده يعني فال النون كونتاكت كولينج از بيتر فروم ذا هايجين بوينت اوف فيو الكولد اير كولينج از سوبيريور ذان ذا كرايجن بيكوز ات دازنت هاف ا كونسيومبل الكرايجن عباره عن كل بالس بت, بت يعني كونسيوم كرايجن وده عباره عن اكسترا كوست الكولد اير داز نوت انترفير وذ ذا ليزر تيشو انتراكشن كرايجن بيعمل كرايجن سبراي على سطح الجلد قبل الليزر بالس فالسكاترنج والريفلكشن هيزيد شويه 
This is not going to be an issue as long as the density of the chromophore is high. Thick hair, large blood vessel, uh, uh, dark pigmentation. And the next one is the density of the density of the chromophore TL. The shara is atrophial, blood vessel is higher, or pigmentation faint. So it will cryogen be interfere with the absorption and we saw the scattering with reflection. And so it will be turn on my allo influence. عشان ياخدوا نفس الافكت تعليه الفلوينس مايت بي اسوشيتد ويز هاي ريسك اوف سايد افكتس موضوع الكولينج كان في تخوف ان احنا لما نيجي نعالج فاسكولار ليجنز الكولينج ممكن يسبب فازو كونستريكشن وبالتالي الكروموفور ما يبقاش هناك وبالتالي يقلل الافكاسي ولكن ده ثبت انه غير صحيح لان ماني كيسز في الفاسكولار ليجنز احنا بنعالج كابيلاريز وي داز نوت هاف ماسكولار لاير في الول فما بيحصلش فازو سباز ولكن لو الكونتاكت كولينج هو اللي بنستخدمه فتو ماتش بريشر على السكين بالكولينج هيعمل سكويزنج للبلاد فيسل وبالتالي البلاد هيخرج وبالتالي مش هيبقى فيه كروموفور فدي نقطه مهمه قوي ان انا لو بستخدم كونتاكت كولينج على فاسكولار ريجن اي شود نوت بريس ذا سكين تو ماتش اذروايز ذا تريتمنت از نوت جوينج تو بي افكتيف اي هوب ذات انسرز ذا كويشن دكتور شادي شكرا دكتور آه برضو في اسئله جايه على الناس اللي عندهم ميديكال بروبلمز ديرماتولوجيكال بروبلمز زي الفيتيليجو والسورايسس وهيعملوا م. ليزر هم خايفين من الكابنرز آه فينومينا انها تحصل آه لو استخدموا الليزر في وجود الليجنز دي فرايك ايه في كده؟ آه طبعا انت استاذتنا في الموضوع ده يا دكتور عبير بس أيوة. هو انت قلتي حاجه مهمه جدا هو قصه الكابنر فينومينا الكابنر فينومينا مش هتطلع مره واحده فعشان كده اي حد عنده ديزيز uh, ممكن يحصل معاه كوبنرايزيشن زي السورايسيس زي الفيتيلايجو زي اللايكن بلانس قبل ما نبتدي العلاج بالليزر وي هاف تو اسك ذا بيشنت اف ذي هاف كوبنر فينومينا الكوبنر فينومينا دي ان يحصل نيو ليجنز ات ذا سايتس اوف تروما ف اف ذا بيشنت داز نوت هاف كوبنر فينومينا يبقى الليزر ويل نوت كاري اني ريسك اون ذا اذر هاند اف ذا بيشنت از هافينج ذا هيستوري اوف كوبنر فينومينا اند كوبنرايزيشن ذن ليزر از كونفيندد تمام. آه بيتسأل حد بيقول البارادوكسيكال هير جروث هو بيسأله كتير خالص عن الهير ريدكشن لأن دي يمكن أكتر حاجات اللي بيشتغلوها آه وأنا عايز إن... عايز أقول بس أطمن الناس إن شارم ديرما ويل هاف ذا كونفرنس إن جولاي وهيكون في أوفر تو دايز السبيسيفيك كلينيكال سبجكتس اللي من ضمنها الهير ريموفال أند ذير ويل بي أ سيشن أباوت هير ريموفال ديديكيتد وأنذر سيشن فور بيجمنتد ليجنز وأ ثيرد سيشن فور فاسكو ليجنز فكل The clinical application of the laser will be, uh, يعني, uh, discussed in details. The شهر الجاي في July, أنا مش فاكر the dates. أكيد دكتور شادي هيقدر إنه announce the exact dates, and it's going to be dedicated for all those clinical applications. إنما uh, as long as the time permits, I'm happy to answer any questions. In uh, هذا, into, يعني, you are in control of time. أنا I'm free today, the whole day. بس إنتوا الوقت عندكم بقى you manage. Yeah, دكتور أشرف أعتقد كده يعني. نقف الجزء الاولاني اللي هو البيزك حضرتك غطيت الاستراكشر بتاع الليزر ما شاء الله يعني اي حد فاهم تركيبه الجهاز وهاو تو اوبتمايز وكمان غطينا ويتش فور ويتش يعني ويتش ويف لانس فور ويتش انديكيشن ودي مهمه جدا والله ما حدش يقدر يبني الدور التاسع او الثامن من غير ما يبني الدور الارضي ده الدور الارضي بتاعنا فيرست جيت وبعد كده المرات اللي جايه باذن الله نقدر نغطي كل انديكيشن لوحده بالظبط كده آه. بندي وقت لكل الابلكيشنز بس اي هوب ان الناس اللي كانت متخوفه من القصه بتاعه ليزر فيزكس شافت دلوقتي ان الموضوع از ابلايد وان احنا وي ديسكاس اونلي ذا براكتيكال امبورتنس بوينت فروم ذا بيزكس وات هاز ان امبورتنت كلينيكال امبلكيشنز اي هوب ان هم قادرين يشوفوا الموضوع كده يعني بالظبط وهطمن الناس برده زملائنا ان ال الفيديو النهارده او اللي اتسجل هيبقى موجود على اليوتيوب تشانل عشان تقدروا تتابعوا اللي فات حاجه لان في ناس كتير زعلانه ان فاتنا الجزء الاولاني اطمنوا ده هيترفع على اليوتيوب ممكن نبتدي الجزء الثاني يا دكتور اشرف بس هنطلع فاصل ونواصل باذن الله اتفضل شكرا
تفضل دكتور اشرف حضرتك ممكن تبدا دكتور اشرف ممكن تتفضل حضرتك ممكن نبدا Okay, so uh, now the second uh, uh, talk is about practical tips of laser safety. And uh, again, laser safety is not a chapter in the laser textbook. Laser safety is not only the laser goggles. There are many aspects of the uh, laser safety which uh, is very important to be refreshed with. It's very important to be implemented every time we touch a laser uh, machine. Otherwise, we increase the risk of uh, problems and accidents and uh, uh, unsatisfactory outcome. So in order to understand the laser safety, it's very important to start with the American National Standard Institute, uh, which is classifying the lasers into a uh, few classes according to the risk. So we start with class one, and uh, the class one laser is having very low energy uh, output. There is no exposure limit, and it is safe for viewing. So it's really very safe to, to, to even look at that lasers. What's the example for that? The laser printers. The laser printers we are having in our offices, uh, homes, clinics, and so on. Uh, those are class one and they are very safe. We don't have any risk with those lasers. Then we have uh, 2A, and uh, this is having even um, uh, also very low fluence, uh, low energy output, and they are safe to look at that laser source for less than 1,000 seconds. They are not intended for direct uh, viewing. However, the, the safety is up to 1,000 seconds. What is the example for that? The barcode scanners in the supermarkets, those are 2A. Then we go to the two class two lasers where they have energy uh, output less than one milliwatts and they are safe if we look at them for less than 0.25 seconds. What is the 0.25 seconds? This is the duration of the eye blink. So when we blink, this is a 0.25 seconds. And we are not supposed to be purposely staring at the beam. Which we should not be looking at the beam. The example of this: the alignment beams. The alignment beams. Those are uh, small laser devices used by the laser technicians to make sure that the laser beam is aligned to the center of the optical fiber or center of the mirror of the uh, articulated arm. So those are two, and the technicians are not supposed to be purposely staring at that beam. Then we go to the uh, class 3A, where the energy output is 1 to 5 milliwatts, and they are hazardous in less than 0.25. So the eye blink will not uh, be enough protection, uh, especially if we are uh, using collecting optics, yani lens, uh, uh, which is collecting and magnifying. We are not supposed to be looking at that beam through uh, collecting optics without protective eyewear. And in this case, we have to be wearing the goggles, which is protecting from that particular wavelength, especially if we are using the collecting optics. The example for that is diode aiming beam. When you are having a laser machine, there is an aiming beam. So this is a diode aiming beam, and we are not supposed to be looking at the aiming beam without wearing the protective goggles. Then we go to 3B, and this has an uh, energy output of 5 to 500 milliwatts. And in this case, we have direct beam or specular reflection hazards in less than an eye blink. And we are not supposed to be looking at that direct beam or even the reflection without wearing the protective eyewears. The example for that is retinal photocoagulators. Retinal photocoagulators are small laser devices used 
by the ophthalmologist to treat the uh, retinal hemorrhage. So they use them in order to coagulate the blood vessels in the retina. Uh, they have low <coughs> output, energy output, not like the dermatological laser, but they have the hazards and you have to be wearing, they, the ophthalmologists have to be wearing goggles when they are using those lasers. And then finally, we have the class four laser, which is having an energy output more than 500 milliwatts. They have direct beam, specular or diffuse reflection hazards in less than an eye blink, where uh, يعني, it is not only uh, the, the, the skin which, which can damage, but also we can have fire hazards uh, and the eye hazards. So uh, we have to wear goggles and take all the precautions. What are the examples for those lasers? All the medical lasers. So all the medical lasers are class four laser and we have to take all the precautions uh, to avoid uh, all the hazards associated with the, the laser. Those are the laser pointers. And laser pointers are uh, actually class 3A. So they are not supposed to be toys in the hand of uh, kids. Uh, they are uh, serious lasers and we have to be careful when we are using them in many uh, uh, conferences. Uh, I feel very upset when a speaker is holding a laser pointer and he is keeping it on and start to uh, wave uh, while it is on towards the audience. Uh, the, this is uh, not a nice practice. So we have to be careful with that. Class four lasers require a signs, uh, sign danger, uh, warning with the phrase laser radiation, avoid eye or skin exposure to direct or scattered radiation. This sign, which is supposed to be on the door of the laser room from outside, uh, giving an alert that there is active laser uh, radiation inside this room. So what are the types of laser hazards? We have eye hazards and skin hazards, which we are going to discuss in more details. Then there is teeth hazards. Teeth hazards, uh, we think it is theoretical. Of course, dentists are using lasers sometimes, and uh, sometimes they are using the lasers, or most of the times they are using the lasers uh, to do something on the gum. However, uh, if they are using the laser for the gum, it's very important to protect the teeth because if they don't protect the teeth and uh, damaging the enamel of the teeth is not the objective of the laser treatment, this can carry a problem and the permanent, the damage to the teeth uh, can be permanent. So we have to be uh, uh, very careful when we are using or the, when the dentists are using the lasers for soft tissue ablation and cutting not to damage the teeth. Now, what about us? Do we have any problem uh, when we are using our lasers on the teeth? Yes. If we are using the lasers for hair removal on the upper lip, in many cases, patients are complaining of teeth ache, pain in the teeth. And this happens when we are using lasers, which are deep in penetration. When we are using those lasers with large spot size, which in which the laser will penetrate deep to the extent that it can affect the nerves of the teeth and can cause pain. So in order to avoid that, we have to use a smaller spot size when we are working on the upper lip. We have sometimes to put a gauze to protect uh, the teeth and the gums uh, so that we don't uh, have any effect on the teeth. It's of course, it's not a, a major damage, just irritation and the patients will feel worry. So sometimes it's very important to pay attention to those small details uh, to avoid uh, you know, inconvenience for the patient. Once the patient is coming for hair removal and then they feel that their teeth are uh, aching, they will not feel comfortable. They will think that we don't know what we are doing. So this is something which we have to pay um, uh, attention for. Fire hazards, again, we read that and we think that this is something theoretical. Uh, how many times we saw a fire in the laser room? Maybe none. However, I'm going to tell you some important situations which we have to pay attention. The first example which comes to my mind, if we are using alcohol to sterilize the skin 
And then we don't wait for the alcohol to vaporize and we start to use lasers which are ablative, CO2 or urban or whatever. If we don't pay attention, the presence of alcohol on the skin or any flammable material can start a fire. And it happened to someone I know where uh, they cleaned the skin with alcohol, then they were using the CO2 and immediately after finishing the alcohol, he started the, to use the laser and then there was a fire on the skin. So this is something we have to be very careful with. Uh, the other thing is that if you are doing hair removal in the face or rejuvenation in the face, and the hair of the patient is in the field, sometimes the hair dyes or some of the hair care products are having flammable materials. So the hair can burn. Sometimes we can have a, a small fire in the area if you are not paying attention that the field of the laser should never have anything which can be flammable. The last thing I would like to emphasize is that the clothes, what we are wearing. Sometimes, uh, especially patients in the Gulf area, they are wearing abaya, clothes, uh, black uh, clothes or black shirt or whatever. And if you don't pay attention and the laser is, uh, is fired on the, this black cloth, if it is black and it is in the field, it is going to be set on fire. So all those are risk of having fire hazards with the laser beam. This is something which we have to avoid. We have to make sure that the field of operation is not having anything flammable. Then we have the electrical and mechanical hazards. And this is something in many cases, the technicians, the laser technicians are exposed to and uh, they have to take all the precaution. They have to be well-trained before they touch the laser. Uh, I know a laser technician who was uh, fixing a laser machine. So he switched on the laser machine. He got the error and then uh, from the screen, and then he switched off the laser machine and start to remove the cover of the laser in order to see, to fix the problem. What he didn't uh, pay attention to is that the <coughs> after switching on the laser machine, there is a capacitor inside, which is having very high charge of electricity. So he should never have touched that capacitor. He didn't pay attention to that. And after removing the cover, although the machine was switched off, he touched the capacitor and the, laser, the capacitor discharged in him. So he got a very strong electrical shock and he was arrested. Luckily, this was in a hospital and he was resuscitated, but this is something which is really very serious and it's not theoretical, it is happening in real life. So we should never try to open the laser machine and touch anything inside unless uh, it's a, a service technician who is uh, well-trained to do that. Now, what about the eye hazards? And I think this is one of the most serious things which we have to pay attention to. All individuals with frequent exposure to the laser beam are required to complete an eye examination. Before we start the laser, this examination is to establish baseline <coughs> of the ocular condition before exposure to laser radiation prior to employment. In the West, here in Canada, in the States, in Europe, uh, if you have a laser technician, a nurse who is helping you, uh, she can come after one year and go and claim that her sight is much worse than one year ago. And this happened because of the repeated working with the laser and she's your employee. So she's asking the physician for compensation. So it is really a very critical situation. And that's why in Europe, uh, it is very much advised that uh, a baseline eye condition and eye examination is done so that after six months, after one year, it is repeated and we see that, do we have any problem? Do we have any deterioration in the site? Is this something linked to the laser or something else? Is this uh, 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 denoting some sort of frequent damage or something which is happening? So it's very important to have baseline uh, eye examination and site examination, vision examination before we start working with the laser. <clears throat> what are the potential targets of damage in the eye with the laser. We have the cornea, that the cornea can be damaged. 
the lens can be damaged and the retina can be damaged. So let us see what are the laser impacts on each of those targets. So the cornea can be damaged by the ultraviolet lasers. The ultraviolet lasers can cause photokeratitis. So if the cornea is exposed frequently to ultraviolet lasers without protection, then we can develop photokeratitis. Also the infrared lasers, whether it's the near infrared or the far infrared, we can get a, a problem with the corneal burn. So we can get a burn in the cornea. If you are using the CO2 or the urban YAG, and we don't have good protection of the eye and it hits the cornea, it ablates the cornea. So this is a corneal ulcer or corneal burn. Even the other infrared lasers can, because it contains heat, it contains water and the water will absorb that laser and heat up. So we can get a corneal burn. What about the lens? The lens can be affected by the ultraviolet uh, lasers and we can go get photochemical cataract. If uh, someone is having phototherapy, and this is applied for the excimer laser, uh, but more even for the uh, UVB cabins and the ultraviolet, uh, uh, the PUVA treatment, then photochemical cataract can happen. And that's why eye coverage and eye protection is very important. And then finally, we have the retina, where with the retina, we can get um, uh, thermal injury, we can get photochemical injury, uh, and we can get retinal burns. And this happens with the visible light and also the infrared light. Here, this is something I would like to highlight and I would like to uh, stop, pause for a minute here because um, a very common mistake and a very common malpractice I'm seeing happening in many clinics during trainings, during uh, treatments uh, uh, in, in the clinics that when we are using visible lights and lasers, IPL, pulse dye laser, KTP, Alexandrite laser, usually if we forget to wear the goggle once, we'll never forget it again because there is strong flash of light. This is a visible light and it is very bright light. So we always are very keen on wearing the goggles while we are working with visible lasers. However, when we are working with invisible lasers, with infrared lasers, diode, NDAG, CO2, erbium, those are infrared lasers. We cannot see the laser pulse. We see the aiming beam, but we don't see the laser pulse. So in many cases, colleagues are reluctant to wear the goggles because they feel that they are safe. However, this is actually a false sense of security. Because if I'm using a, a visible light, when the laser or the light is emitted from the light reflection, we are having a reflex blinking. And this is at least a protective mechanism. Whereas if I'm using infrared laser, I don't have this protective mechanism. I cannot see the laser beam, so I don't blink. And that's why the incidence of eye damage with infrared lasers is much higher than with visible lasers. We don't blink. We don't have the luxury to blink. And that's why this is very important. You are not seeing the laser beam. It doesn't mean that you are safe. Actually, you are more at risk. So I strongly encourage all the practitioners to uh, uh, wear the goggles uh, with all the lasers, of course, but with infrared lasers more than even with the visible lasers. With the visible lasers, they will wear it anyway because they cannot work without those. So this is a very important thing we have to remember. Now we spoke in the beginning uh, about the diffuse reflection, specular reflection, direct exposure, and so on. What is the meaning of that? Direct exposure means that the laser is going to be emitted directly towards the eye. So uh, it happens especially when uh, uh, a laser technician is examining the laser, working on the laser, and then accidentally the laser fires into the eye. Or we are working for a patient in the face, the patient is not wearing the goggle, or he moves suddenly, so the goggle goes off, and then with the movement, the laser goes into the eye. 
this is the most severe damage to the eye because all the laser pulse will go into the eye. So this is very serious and this is something which we should avoid uh, with all the power we have. Then we have what's called specular reflection. And in this case, we have a mirror. So the laser is going to be reflected on a mirror and then the beam is going to be reflected directly towards the eye. This is called specular reflection. In this case, the mirror is reflecting 100% of the beam towards the eye. And that's why, again, this is very serious. And that's why the laser room should never have any mirrors, should not have any reflecting objects. It's again, is the laser safety. Sometimes I go to conduct training in a, a new clinic, and then I'm, I'm shocked to see that the floor is made of porcelain, which is very reflective. This is again is the laser safety. Everything in the laser room should be matte. So it doesn't have a potential uh, risk of reflecting the laser beam. Then we have the diffuse reflection where the laser is going to be uh, uh, hit towards a, a reflecting surface, which is not dull. And then it's going to the, the laser is going to be diffused. Part of the laser will go back to the eye. And that's why uh, no reflecting objects should be uh, in the laser room. So those are the different types of uh, exposure to the laser beam. This is a fundus uh, examination of a laser technician uh, who was 21 years and she was working with the NDAG laser 1064 and all of the sudden when she uh, was working with the laser, she felt two or three yellowish flashes at the time of the laser exposure uh, immediately her uh, left eye was um, the visual acuity 20 over 50. And then uh, after some time, after uh, two days, uh, 20, 20, 15. Four days after the accident, there was a, a fevial edema, as you can see. But then one month after it is resolved, but there is a permanent damage. So this is something which we should avoid. And it is the damage is permanent, depending on where it is, is it close to the fovea or no? Uh, but, but damage is damage to the retina. So this is something which we have to avoid uh, and we have to uh, prevent any situation which can lead to such scenario. To avoid the damage, we have to use eyewear, uh, the laser goggles. And on the laser goggles, we have to have a label which is showing the wavelength and the optical density. For the wavelength, it's really very important to make sure that the goggle we are wearing is having protection from the wavelength we are using. In many cases, I go to some workshops or clinics or whatever, and they have multiple laser systems. And then when we start, I find that some of the attendees are wearing goggles, which are protecting from other laser systems than the one we are using. So it's very important to make sure that the goggle you are wearing is the right goggle to the laser you are going to work with. The other important thing is the optical density. Optical density is the percentage of transmission. So if we have optical density zero, then 100% of the laser is going to go through that uh, window, that lens or that whatever it is. So, and the more the optical density, the less the transmission. So the minimum optical density acceptable is optical density four. This is the minimum which we can accept. Today, there are many Korean and Chinese manufacturers of uh, goggles, and some of them are not to the standard. So it's very important to check the optical density. And if it is less than four, then it is going to be a problem and it's not protecting enough. Of course, the higher the optical density, uh, the more opaque, the more, the more uh, difficult to see through. So that's why it's very important to have the good balance between a good optical density and, uh, and at the same time to be able to see through. So an optical density of five and six is considered very good and very safe. The other important thing which I would like to highlight is that the goggles are not going to be good to go as long as the laser is still operational. Every six months, I have to check and examine my goggles because if the covering coat is damaged, then it's not protective anymore. If the lens is cracked, 
this is more dangerous to wear than not because it can cause diffraction and it can guide the laser beam towards your eye. So never wear um, a goggle which is having a cracked lens. Never do that. When we finish working with the goggles, we should put it in its case. We should never put the lens of the goggle on the surface because if we do that, then the lens coat is going to be damaged. And this is going to carry a lot of risk uh, for the operator. So it's very important to keep it well, to clean it well with the right material uh, and uh, sterilize it, uh, of course, because this is a very important protection. In the era of the COVID-19, when we have goggles, it's very important to have this side shield, not only because of the laser protection, but also for any transmission. We know that transmission can happen through the eyes. So it's very important to have these goggles and uh, in many cases, uh, also the shield, besides, of course, the mask, which we are going to talk about later on. For the patients, we have the patient's goggles, which are the normal goggle for the patients and the intraocular uh, uh, shields, which we are using if we are treating inside the orbital margin. Uh, because we don't want to damage the eye. <coughs> Some patients are having claustrophobia, so they don't like to wear those goggles. They want to see uh, through. This is okay to give them this operator goggle as long as we are walking in the body. However, if you are walking in the head and neck, it is very important to use the patient goggle. Uh, we cannot uh, uh, give up this because it will carry risk. Uh, this is going to be required only in the case of uh, the uh, treatment done in the periorbital area. Of course, in order to use those uh, intraocular shield, we have to use a drop of uh, um, uh, anesthesia for the eye, and then we apply it, we do the procedure, and then we remove it. There are different sizes of those, so we use the right appropriate size to the uh, patient size of the eye. The, they are small for the kids, medium for children, and large for adults. And we are supposed to be using the right size for the patient. Of course, the smaller it is, the easier to insert. However, if it is too small for the patient, then it's not protective enough. So it's important to use the right size for the patient. It is something which we can sterilize. I don't recommend at all to use plastic disposable ones. I prefer much better to use the uh, um, uh, autoclavable one. And of course, uh, we have to make sure that it's sterilized and uh, the, the, how to put it, how to insert it, how to remove it without inducing any corneal damage is very important. Now we go to a very important topic, uh, which is the laser generated air contaminant. Air contaminated due to interaction of lasers, uh, laser beam with target material, we can generate toxic gases released from uh, excitement lasers. This will require special cabinet and air handling. Exhaust ventilation with special filters may be needed. Uh, again, with the era of the COVID-19, it's very important to work in a well, <clears throat> well ventilated room to have good suction, good smoke evacuator in order to avoid any contamination in the room. And this was a very interesting uh, article about uh, uh, which was published in 2016, end of 2016, about gaseous and particulate content of laser hair removal plume. And they found that there are 62 organic compounds identified, including carcinogens and toxins in the plume generated by the hair removal. So they concluded that the laser hair removal should be considered as biohazard warranting the use of smoke evacuators, good ventilation, respiratory protection, especially for the health workers. People who are doing hair removal more than 10 patients per day, they are exposed to those 62 organic compounds, which are carcinogens and toxins. So maybe soon we are going to require uh, the, the practitioners to wear the chemical masks. Of course, not to that extent, however, good mask, good ventilation, uh, smoke evacuation, and respiratory protection are going to be required. When we come to the plume, any ablative lasers can create plume 
of smoke that can potentially harm the surgeon, the patient, and the operating uh, personnel. So also it was found that various bacterial spores and human papillomavirus particles have been recovered alive from the carbon dioxide laser probe. This is a very critical issue. If you are working with ablative laser on a patient of wards, be sure that this smoke is containing the human papilloma virus alive. And there are case reports of physicians who got laryngeal, uh, laryngeal papilloma after treating wards. So this is a serious thing, which requires two important things. The laser specific surgical mask, this is the N95. Everyone today knows the N95. So the, the normal surgical mask is not enough for protection. And also the smoke evacuator. And the smoke evacuator in order to be effective, we have to hold it not more than two centimeters away from the surface of the skin. If I am holding the smoke evacuator too far, it is losing the effectiveness. It has to be maximum two centimeters away from the surface of the skin. This is how we ensure that it is effective. And when we are using the laser to uh, ablate any tissue which might contain virus, the N95 is very important. Now, uh, uh, if we have a, a possibility to use non-ablative lasers to treat warts, I prefer that I personally stopped to use the ablative lasers to treat warts. I prefer to use something like the pulse dye laser or the NDAG which are non-ablative to treat wards because number one, they are effective. Number two, they are not vaporizing the tissue. So we don't have risk of contamination, contamination of the air, contamination of the staff. So non-ablative lasers can be used or better used in treating such conditions. There's no evidence that the HIV or the hepatitis virus or even the COVID are transmitted in the laser chrome. However, we have to pay attention to what we are doing, the procedure and what risk we should uh, we, we, we carry in order to avoid those practices and take all the precautions to avoid contamination uh, during the procedure which we are doing. If we look at the laser types and the accidents, we are going to see that the NDAG laser uh, is having the highest incidence of uh, accidents because it's deep in penetration, because it's used by different chromophores and because it's infrared, so we cannot blink, we cannot see it. And that's why it has the highest uh, potential risk of accidents and the incidence of uh, accidents are highest to the NDAG. If we look at the laser accidents by professional accident activity, then laser technicians are showing the highest incidence of problem. Why? Because when they are doing what they are doing uh, on regular basis, sometimes they, they feel confident. They don't take the basics uh, of the practice and in many cases, they, they, they don't wear the goggles or they don't take all the precautions required. They don't wait for the alcohol to be vaporized and so on. So the, the, uh, we can see that doctors or nurses are more careful. Uh, the maintenance service also are very careful. So uh, the technicians should pay more attention uh, to uh, the procedure and the basics of the laser safety. Otherwise, we are going to see uh, more laser accidents. When we look at the causes of laser accidents, <clears throat> we are going to see alignment is 28%. High voltage power supply failure or uh, uh, disorder can cause also 16%. Malfunction, 8%. And improper restoration of laser after servicing is 4%. This adds up to 56%. And this means that the, the proper maintenance and preventive maintenance of the laser machine can avoid more than half of the laser accidents. And that's why it's very important always to keep the laser in uh, well-maintained with very good supervision from the technicians in order to avoid the, the accidents of the lasers. Now, this was regarding the laser safety. Now, a very important topic which I would like to highlight uh, before we end, uh, which is the difference between professional errors and adverse effects and complications. <clears throat> to differentiate between those two items, professional errors 
can be distinguished from adverse effects and complications that the former, the professional error, can be preventable. So professional, professional errors, this is something which we can stop, we can prevent, we can dec decrease it to 0%. However, complications, even in the best hands, we are going to see an incidence of complications. And we have to communicate those possibilities with the patients because some of the complications or the side effects are going to happen with high percentage as we are going to see. However, professional errors should never happen and we should do all our efforts in order to minimize it to 0%. What are the causes of professional errors? Deficient training. When we are getting the training through a salesperson or a laser um, a biomedical engineer, uh, this is in many cases not enough. And in many cases, actually, I feel that we as physicians are having responsibility because, and I have seen that in many cases as physicians, we start to ask the people sent by the company for training who are not medical, are not having medical background about some clinical indication. Can I use it for acne? If there is a burn, how should I deal with it? Those are questions which really should be dealt with a dermatologist. A dermatologist should be able to come up with an answer, not a biomedical engineer or not a, a trainer who is not a physician. So in many cases, we, do, we have to do our own homework in order to come up with the right indications. Even if the company is claiming that I can use a Q-switched laser in, treated, in treating port wine stain because it has a wavelength of 585. No, it doesn't work. The wavelength is correct, but the pulsing range is not correct. So in many cases, we have to exert more efforts in order to be well-educated, well-trained, and avoid the problems which can happen from the deficient training. Lack of documentation. This is, again, something which is a problem. If I have a patient, and we are going to see some photos of that, and the patient, after a few sessions, coming to complain that I got hyperpigmentation or I got a scar after the laser treatment, if I didn't have a photo of the patient before I treat her, and I did not put in the notes that this patient is having a scar on the area I'm going to use the laser on, or she's having hyperpigmentation on this area, when the patient come back and claim that she developed that scar or that hyperpigmentation from the laser, I cannot defend myself. On the other hand, if I have the photo, if I have my notes, if I have the documents where I report any problem existing in the skin of the patient before I touch her, then I tell her, no, this problem was there before we start and so on. If I don't take proper history and I don't document that the patient is on photosensitizer or taking anticoagulant or taking whatever medication it is, then we can have problems which are unexpected or we don't tell the patient, expect that we might have some bruises because you are taking anticoagulant. And then the patient will be scared, will think that we did something wrong. And there is a very important uh, saying, which I always like to remind my colleagues, that explaining something to the patient before it happens is called patient education, and it is very highly appreciated. Explaining something to the patient. After it happens, it's called apology, and the patient expects compensation. So it's very important to spend enough time with the patient explaining about the treatment, about the limitations, about the expectations, about the skincare required, about what uh, should be taken into consideration, what to avoid, and so on, before we do the procedure, so that the patient is having the appropriate expectations and not uh, uh, got with a surprise about something he didn't expect. Uh, inadequate and inexact patient information. This is the same point. Incorrect determination of indications. I have a hair removal laser and I have a patient coming for port one stain. So I start to treat the uh, port one stain with the hair removal laser. It will never work. Or I have a pulse dye laser and I try to use it for uh, hair removal, it will not work. Incorrect diagnosis, pigmented lesion, I start to treat it while it is not supposed to be treated. This is a big disaster. Failure to perform test treatments when this is indicated, this is a professional error. 
and of course incorrect operation of the laser and this is going to be going with a deficient training. All those are something which we should avoid, we should uh, uh, stop and we can stop. This is an example of uh, the, the, a patient who got hypopigmentation after hair removal. So this is something which can happen. It can be a professional error if it is due to one of the factors we just discussed and it can be a complication. So when we evaluate a patient like that, do we consider that a professional error or a side effect? If you look at the spacing of the pulses, and if you look at the size of the pulses, sometimes it is having large size, sometimes it's slow, it's smaller. So it seems that the person who used the laser is inexperienced. Uh, and the too high fluence was, was used, and that's why it caused this hypopigmentation. So from my point of view, this is definitely a professional error and a lack of or deficient training. And this is something which should not happen. Also, a very important point, which we have to pay attention to, that in a poorly supervised laser practice, the pressure to convert all consultations into treatments may result in poor patient selection. So a patient is not indicated, but we are trying to push the patient in order to generate income. And this in turn may dramatically increase the rate of adverse effects. So this is something which should never be the case. We should never uh, push a patient for treatment for something unless it's really indicated and they are get, going to get a value. Over, uh, over that, if we have a technique or a technology which is going to be less costly, as effective or more effective, then we have to let the patient uh, honestly go for the other uh, applications. For example, if we have a patient of, I don't know, molluscum contagiosum, and we have a laser, and laser can be used to treat molluscum contagiosum, but we know that the needle extraction of the molluscum might be the more simple, uh, less expensive, uh, and everything. Then this is how we are going to recommend uh, the, the treatment for the patients. Lasers are tools in our hands, among so many other tools. <clears throat> so it's very important to use it wisely, to use it when it is superior than other uh, modalities, and be honest with the patient to let them know what to expect and how much this is going to be better than other modalities. This is a patient who was treated with an Alexandrite laser in the sun. The patient was tanned, and uh, after the treatment, she got hypopigmentation. Maybe the Alexandrite is not the appropriate laser to be uh, used when the patient is tanned. In this case, maybe it's better to use a diode or NDI laser. So this is improper selection of uh, the laser under these circumstances. The same patient can be used with the Alexandrite, but after <clears throat> preparation of the skin, after using sunscreen, after getting rid of the tan or in the winter. But in, under these circumstances, this was not the right selection of the lasers. And this is a patient who is skin type five and IPL was used where of course it caused hyperpigmentation. This is not the right thing to do. Um, especially in the older versions of the IPL where pulse duration was not possible to be selected. It was one fixed pulse duration. So definitely I would never use an IPL in a skin like that uh, with old version of the system without proper cooling. Otherwise we are going to be having such hyperpigmentation. So hyperpigmentation, the incidence of hyperpigmentation uh, uh, is often linked to laser selected. It may be minimized with daily sun protection and bleaching cream at night if we are afraid of the PIH. On the other hand, hyperpigmentation, it is usually transient, but it can last for 12 months. And the causes of the hyperpigmentation might be destruction of melanocytes, suppression of melanogenesis due to the heat, and redistribution of melanin in the keratinocytes. So this is the hyperpigmentation which can happen. Also, hyperpigmentation is a common uh, thing to happen after Q-switched lasers, especially Q-switched Alexandrite and Ruby, after few sessions, after maybe five, six sessions, but it is temporary and repigmentation will happen within a year. Now, this is a case of port one stain, and uh, we can see that the NDA laser was used to treat port one stain in this situation. 
was this the right wavelengths to be used? Of course, no, because with the NDAG, which is deep in penetration, which is not selective, which is not highly absorbed by the oxymoglobin, we had to use high fluence. And with high fluence, we are not targeting the hemoglobin only. We are also affecting the melanin and the water. So scarring was the outcome. And that's why it's very important to select the right wavelengths, the right type of laser for the right indication. Otherwise, we are going to be left with much higher uh, incidence of side effects. And if it is our uh, selection for the wrong laser, this is a professional error which should be avoided. On the other hand, this is a patient who had port one stain and was treated with a pulse dye laser, and then they got purple. Now, if we tell the patient from the beginning, before we start the treatment, that we expect to have purple, and this is a sign of improvement, <clears throat> the patient would be expecting this purple, and this is going to be taken by the patient as a sign of efficacy. However, if we didn't tell the patient about that and the patient does not expect that, this is a big problem. They will think that we burned them and they might go and complain, file a complaint. So it's really very important to know what to expect and communicate that with the patient. This is going to increase the patient compliance, increase the patient confidence in what we are uh, saying, and this is building the trust. So communication is very important. Um, there are some practical situations where uh, maybe it's better to just keep that for um, the, the later discussions or the hair removal sessions uh, in, in one month. However, one of the problems which can happen is that a patient comes to tell you after hair removal, I got white hair. So if this was a pre-existing condition and the white hair was there from the beginning, but masked by black hair, we have to let the patient know that you have white hair and the white hair will not be affected by the laser. The black hair will go away, but the white hair doesn't have a chromophore. So the white hair is going to be more apparent after the treatment. If we didn't tell the patient that from the beginning or if we didn't examine the patient and we didn't realize that the patient has white hair and it's going to, uh, to be more apparent afterwards, the patient might come back to complain to tell you you did hair removal for me and now I developed white hair. So we are going to be blamed. So it's very important to pay attention to those little things. Otherwise we are going to be blamed. So it can be a pre-existing condition. Now, can our laser treatment induce whitening of the hair? Yes. If we used insufficient fluence in predisposed patients, which means that we have a patient who is in the late forties, the hair is still black but it's about to become white. If we use conservative fluence in order to protect the skin, this conservative fluence can damage the follicular melanin without enough heat transmitted to the hair follicle, without damaging the hair follicle. So we convert a black hair into a white hair without damaging the hair follicle itself. So don't use conservative parameters when the patient is in the late 40s. Otherwise, you can convert a black hair into a white hair. This is something we don't want to do. Use the right parameters, the right fluence, the right pulse duration, and protect the skin by cooling instead of decreasing the fluence or increasing the pulse duration. And this is a patient who came after a few laser sessions to claim that we induced white hair. Yes, there are some white hairs here. Luckily, in that patient, we had a photo of before. So we were able to spot the white hairs, as we can see here, which she didn't realize, which she didn't see before, because they were masked by the black hair. Once we get rid of the black hair, the white hair became more prominent, more apparent. So uh, it's very important to examine the patient, to tell her this white hair is not going to be affected. On the contrary, it's going to be more apparent because it is unmasked when we get rid of the black hair. So this was a point. Another thing is the paradoxical hair growth. And this is a problem which can happen. Uh, as I said, when we are treating fine hair in dark skin, we have a challenge because everything we need to do for the fine hair, we need its opposite for the dark skin. Fine hair need a wavelength, which is highly absorbed by the melanin, like 
the IPL, like the alexandrite, like the ruby laser. Whereas in dark skin, we need lasers which are less absorbed by melanin, like the diode or the India laser. So this is a contradiction. Fluence, fine, fine here, we need to increase the fluence because the absorption is going to be less. However, in dark skin, we need to decrease the fluence, otherwise we can damage the epidermal melanin and cause a problem. Pulse duration, in the fine hair, we have small chromophore, short pulse duration, sh short thermal extension time, so the pulse duration has to be shorter. Whereas in dark skin, we have large chromophore epidermal melanin, which we don't want to affect, so I, so I have to use a pulse duration above the thermal extension time, so I have to use long pulse duration. So this is a contradiction. Cooling, fine hair, it's okay to use the cooling, but in dark skin, we have to increase the cooling. Otherwise, the pain is going to be more because of the melanin of the epidermis, which is absorbing the laser and converting into heat. So dark skin patients will feel more pain than fur skin. So we have to use cooling. In fine hair, we don't want to use too much cooling because already the absorption is low. And if we decrease the temperature of the skin, we might affect the outcome. So everything is contradicting uh, and it's very difficult. And that's why this is where we can see higher incidence of paradoxal hair growth. So I would like to skip this area because uh, of uh, the time factor. However, we have to differentiate between two important scenarios. Untreated area in close proximity to the treated area where the hair growth will increase in the area around the area we treat. So I treat my chin for hair removal, it responds well. However, the area around the chin will start to have more hair growth. This is one scenario. The other scenario is that I am having fine hair in my face. I treat this area, but then the hair growth increase in this area. Those are two different scenarios. In the first scenario, When we are treating uh, the, 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 the hair, in both scenarios, actually, underlying pathology will increase the incidence of paradoxical hair growth. So if I have polycystic ovary or any hormonal disturbances, then the incidence of paradoxical hair growth, whether it's this type or that type, are going to be more. But in the first scenario, when I treat an area and it responds, but then the area surrounding it is having paradoxical hair growth, then it's the cooling. If we have contact cooling or cryogen cooling, it's cooling the area in a limited time period. Whereas with cold air cooling, it is causing bulk cooling. So it cools the area before, during, and after the laser pulse. So it is very efficient way of cooling and the incidence of paradoxical air growth with air cooling is less than with contact cooling or cryogen sprays. If you have a system which does not have cold air cooling, it's not the end of the world. You just need to have ice uh, compressors in the treated area and the surrounding area for 10 minutes after the laser session. This is going to decrease the incidence of paradoxical hair growth because you are not allowing the uh, collateral thermal diffusion and photobiostimulation. What about if the area you treated starts to show more uh, hair growth, then you are using wrong parameters because the parameters you used increased the hair stimulation and instead of reducing the hair. Either the fluence is too low or the pulse duration is too long or you are not using the right wavelengths. So you have to revise the parameters. So this is regarding the paradoxical hair growth and this is an example of a patient who had more hair growth after the laser treatment and usually it happens in darker skin people in the face and in the neck. This is the most common area what we need to think of suboptimal fluence, long pulse duration in cases of fine hair, long wavelengths in fine hair, and fine hair with cryogen. Cryogen, as we said, is going to increase the scattering and reflection, so suboptimal energy delivery, and we can uh, induce photobiostimulation. Um, acne for eruption is something which can happen after hair removal, and in many cases, uh, People are complaining of that. Usually it happens in younger patients. It happens more in Fitzpatrick skin types uh, five followed by three and uh, four. And uh, usually it's mild and lasts for short duration. And in many cases it's foreign body reaction because when we use the laser, it damaged the hair follicle. And in this case, uh, we have a foreign body now 
where uh, it is a reaction like the pseudofolicoids Barbie, where the hair is sturdy and goes back to the skin and causes this foreign body reaction. And we have to let the patient know that this is uh, something which is going to subside with the subsequent sessions. Nothing to worry about. It's not infection. So antibiotics will not help. Sometimes we can use weak steroid cream. Uh, we can have a combination, Fusicort, for example, or uh, Fusidine H, um, but uh, the cortisone is going to be enough and the uh, uh, reaction will decrease with the subsequent sessions. Um, another thing is this is a patient who had an eyebrow tattoo and the operator did not pay attention that this is the first session where the ink is fresh and the absorption is very strong and started with high fluence, six or seven joule per centimeter square with the Q switch at the end. This is a mistake. When the ink is having high concentration, we have to use with much less fluence because the absorption is very strong. So if we use uh, high fluence, then we can get ulceration. And as we can see, it's going to be a big problem. So it's very important to uh, pay attention to the basics, which we started with. High density of the chromophore, low fluence will do the job with much better safety profile. Uh, this is from the basics, but we can see the practical importance of that. Thick hair, you don't need to use high fluence because it's going to damage the surrounding tissue as well. And vice versa, if you are having fine hair, if you are having faint pigment, this is where we need to use higher fluence and shorter pulse duration. So this is the patient and we can see the alteration. Uh, this is a patient who was treated with hair uh, removal with an IPL with contact cooling. And we can see that the distribution of the energy was not uh, very um, homogeneous because it's a curvy surface. So when we are having a contact cooling device, it's very important to make sure that the full surface of the skin is in contact with the cooling tip. Otherwise, as happened here, if it is curved, then an area which is in co close contact with the skin will be cooled, but there is an area like this where it is going to be exposed to the light without cooling and we can see the damage. And this is what Dr. Abir was referring to that sometimes we have see, we can see crescent-like hyperpigmentation when the non-contact handpiece is not in full contact with the skin, not perpendicular on the skin. So the cryogen can hit the side of the handpiece will not go to the skin, whereas the laser will go. So we can see crescent-like hyperpigmentation due to the uh, non-perpendicular position of the handpiece. And this can cause burns and uh, later on pigmentary problems. Uh, on the other hand, the direction of the cooling tip. So if it's a curvy surface, I can change the position so that I put it parallel to the uh, skin so that I'm in a much, much better uh, contact with the skin. And this is uh, a patient who was treated uh, for hair removal. This was the fourth session. And during, uh, during the, uh, the session, the patient was reporting that the pain was much more than the previous sessions. So the technician didn't pay attention to that comment and continued the treatment. When the patient went home, she sent her photos and she had those uh, skin uh, lesions, skin burns. And when they looked into the handpiece of the laser, they found this damage on the optics. And this happens when they are treating hair removal when they're doing hair removal on large area and fragments of the hair will be deposited on the handpiece. And then we, we they keep firing the laser. So those fragments are going to be burned and damage the filter or the lens of the handpiece. And this will cause some hot spots on the skin and cause burn. So it's very important to clean the handpiece uh, every uh, few pulses, 100 or 150 pulses to avoid such a problem. This patient developed afterwards hypopigmentation, which is going to repigment. It's not a big issue. However, of course, it's much better to avoid something like that. And we can see the repigmentation, which happens in a few months. So uh, this was the end of my presentation. Finally, I would like to invite uh, all of you to become uh, uh, ESLD member, the European Society for Lasers and Energy Based Devices. Uh, the ESLD is a nonprofit organization dedicated for uh, education in the field of laser and energy based devices. It grants free membership for postgraduate students, for residents, 
so this is the website of the ESLB and uh, visit the website. Uh, there is a lot of uh, activities for the ESLB, which I would love to see many of you becoming members. And thank you very much for your attention. دكتور شادي سامعك. اوكي يا دكتور. اشكرك والله على الوقت على الوقت الاساسي ده. ربنا يخليك. موجود رائع حضرتك كنت لازم تستفي ربنا يكون في حضرتك انت بتتكلم كل الوقت ده. اي هوب بس ان ان احنا حسينا انه السيفتي اتس نوت حاجه نظريه وبس فيها حاجات كتير فيها يعني براكتيكال امبورتنس. ومحتاجين جدا ان احنا تو ريمبر الكلام ده يعني واحنا بنشتغل كل مره بنمسك الجهاز بتاع الليزر. تمام عشان كده احنا برضه اسئلتنا النهارده هتبقى برضه متعلقه اكتر بال 
الجيش الخطر اللي هي بيها بقى يوم ال اتش تي بي الكوفيد 19 حتى الاير كلوب السؤال اللي جالنا برضه دلوقتي مؤخرا السؤال الريسيرفس عموما في الجيم هو الفيوم بتطلع من الريسيرفس فاش سي تو فاش نيجي لتقليل الريسيرفس بتاع الليزر هي زي نفسها بحمل نفس الريسك بتاع الليزر اير كلوب اللي هي السوبيت بتاع الليزرز هو الريسيرفسنج هيطلع منه بلوم احنا وي ار فابورايزنج تيشو فهو احنا حتى قبل الموضوع بتاع الكوفيد لازم نبقى عندنا بريكوشنز لازم يبقى في سموك ايفاكويتور والسموك ايفاكويتور لازم ده ما يبقاش اكتر من 2 سم اواي فروم ذا سكين لازم نبقى لابسين الماسك لو في اي احتمال انه يبقى في فايرال بارتيكلز في التيشو انا اي وود اي وود بريفير ان انا البس ال N95 مع السموك ايفاكويتور إذا ما كانش الـ N95 موجود يبقى على الأقل أبقى لابس سيرجيكال ماسك ومعاه الفيس شيلد ودول الحاجات دي بقت متوفرة دلوقتي فدي الحاجات اللي إحنا محتاجين إن إحنا نعملها طبعًا عايز أقول بس إن إحنا اللي هيزيد على ما قبل الكوفيد 19 إن إحنا محتاجين إن إحنا نبقى سيلكتيف في البيشنس اللي إحنا وي أكسبت يعني أي حد احتمال يكون بوزيتيف من الهيستوري من ان هو كان جاي من سفر قريب او كان ملاصق لحاله بوزيتيف او حاجه زي كده ما حبتش نتعمل البروسيجر ده دلوقتي فيعني بس احنا محتاجين نبقى واخدين البريكوشنز العاديه اللي احنا عارفينها قبل ما نعمل اي بروسيجر بالنسبه للسبيسيفيك بروسيجرز الابليشن والريسيرفسنج ما اعتقدش ان هو هيبقى في حاجه محتاجين نعملها زياده غير اللي كان بيتعمل قبل كده بس نبقى عارفين انه لو في البيشنت بوزيتيف محتاجين ان احنا نبقى لابسين الماسك بتاعنا البيشنت لو هو احنا بنشتغل في حته ما هياش في الفيس يبقى هو كمان لابس الماسك بتاعه ونبقى السموك ايفاكيوتر موجود وبنستخدمه ما يبقاش بعيد اكتر من 2 سم من سطح الجلد تمام دكتور اشرف طبعا محاضره قيمه جدا ومهمه جدا والسيفتي ميجرز في منتهى الامال في الدنيا وانت غطيتها بشكل رائع في حد حقيقه سال سؤال لطيف جدا انا شايفاه من الاسئله المهمه انه يقول انا ما بلبس النضاره يعني هو بسبب ما بيلبسش النضاره وهو بيشتغل انه النضاره تبقى غامقه وهو ما بيشوفش الفيلد وهو بيشتغل فهو عشان كده بيبقى مثلا مع الانفراريد ليزر زي الانديج هو مش بيشوفه قوي مش بيضايقه زي مثلا فالس الدايل بيضرب فلاش جنب في العين فعشان كده ما بيلبسش النضاره آه فاحنا آه يعني عاوز حل للموضوع ازاي ان هو يقدر يشوف الفيلد وهو بيشتغل رغم ان الجلاسز بتبقى اوبيك ما هو طبعا دي نقطه انا يعني ذكرناها ان غالبا دي هنلاقي الاوبتيكال دنسيتي بتاع النضاره دي آه عالي قوي يمكن 8 ولا حاجه فعشان كده لو قدر ان هو يجيب نظاره الاوبتيكال دنس بتاعتها خمسه او سته هتبقى سيف وفي نفس الوقت هيبقى قادر ان هو يشوف من خلالها. فده الحل، الفكره بقى ايه انه احنا كتير بنستسهل ان احنا ما نلبسش نظاره عشان السبب ده بس عرفنا احنا الهازردز على الاقل لو انا مضطر ان انا اعمل كده ابقى متاكد ان الاوبريتنج فيلد اللي انا فيه ما فيش اي حاجه ريفلكتف، ما فيش اي حاجه ممكن تعكس الليزر بيم. ساعتها يعني خلاص يضطر ان هو يعمل كده لحد ما يجيب نظاره الاوبتيكال دنس بتاعتها خمسه او سته وساعتها هيلاقي ان هو قادر يشوف من خلالها بصوره جيده جدا من غير ما يبقى فيه اي مشكله وطبعا ات از جوينج تو بي ماتش سيفر. طيب كمان كانوا بيسالوا ازاي نعمل استريلايزيشن للسيفتي جوجلز يعني هل الالكول هيكون كفايه ولا محتاجين ان هم يستخدموا حاجه اقوى من كده علشان يعملوا بيها استريلايزيشن. والبارتس اللي بيستخدموها في الـ في الليزر هو في المفروض فيزر. تمام هو المفروض ان المانوفاكشرز بتاعت الليزر ماشينز او المانوفاكشرز بتاعت الجوجلز يبقى عندهم انستراكشنز اباوت ايه الماتيريالز اللي سيف تو بي يوزد فور ستريلايزيشن من غير ما تعمل دامج للماتيريالز يعني احنا ممكن في بعض الاستريلايزنج ماتيريال نيجي نشتغل بيها على النضارات وده حصل معانا في معهد الليزر في وقت من الاوقات يا دكتور عبير ان احنا لقينا أيوه. بعد شويه النضارات بقت اوبيك ما هياش بترانسميت اللايت ما بنقدرش نشوف وترمت في الزباله لان أيوة. عمل دامج للكوت وعمل دامج للماتيريال فمهم قوي ان احنا وقت ما بنجيب جهاز ليزر او وبيبقى معاه جوجلز ان احنا يبقى عندنا الانستراكشنز ايه الماتيريالز اللي سيف تو بي يوزد فور كلينينج اند ستريلايزيشن وذاوت دامجنج دوس ماتيريالز ساعات كتير بيبقى الايثانول ساعات كتير بيبقى حاجات ثانيه 
هي اللي بتستخدم بس دي ما نقدرش ان احنا نعممها لازم نجيب الناس المانيفاكتشرز الويب سايت بتاعهم يا اما بيبقى مكتوب يا اما بنكونتاكت ذيم باي ايميل ان انا عندي الديس برودكت ومحتاج اعرف ايه الماتيريالز اللي سيف تو بي يوزد فور ستيرلايزيشن طيب ده ده في الاحوال العاديه لكن مثلا بالنسبه لقصه اللي ان احنا في كوفيد 19 دلوقتي الكرايسيس اللي احنا فيها دي هل احنا محتاجين حاجه نعمل ستيرلايزيشن بيها غير الطريقه اللي هتبقى مقترحه علينا الشركه لا خالص لان الايثانول مثلا هو ده بيستخدم في حاجات كتير في الاستريلايزيشن وده بيبقى يعني بي فيريسايدل يعني بيموت الفيروس بيموت البكتيريا فديس از مور ذان انف المهم بس ان احنا لما نستخدم الحاجات دي يعني نديلها وقت عشان تنشف ما تبقاش مبلوله لما نيجي نستخدمها عشان فاير تمام. هازردز تمام كده سؤال برضو ريجاردنج نفس البوينت انا عاوز انصح الناس او اديهم بروبورشن زي طهر الجهاز بتاعه يعني الانسترومنتس نفسها السبيسر سبيشالي كمان احنا بقى عندنا حالات ريبورتد ان بيجي لهم انفكشن من اتش بي بي نتيجه الكونتاكت طبعا يعني دي مشكله بنقابلها الفتره الاخيره طبعا الجهاز الكونتاكت والجهاز النون كونتاكت ازاي اخد حذري واطهره صح قبل ما اشتغل تمام هو انا عايز اقول بس ان غالبا يا دكتور شادي الموضوع بتاع الترانسميشن بتاع الهيومن بابيلوما فايروس ده بيبقى اكتر من الشيفنج والتريمنج اكتر من الليزر لان الكونتاكت بيبقى محتاج يتعمل لونج كونتاكت انما في بعض العيادات they use the, the same shaving devices in between the patients and this is definitely a much more important cause of transmission than the handpiece of the laser احنا عارفين كده فمحتاجين نبقى متاكدين اي حد بي يعني عنده البراكتس ده يبقى متاكد ان التكنيشنز والناس اللي عنده They are using the disposable uh, shavers, and uh, they dispose it immediately. Bad, uh, not to use it. This is uh, ABC, طبعا. بالنسبة بقى ال hand pieces في contact cooling, uh, as I said, the uh, ethanol ده من الحاجات اللي بتستخدم كتير uh, وسيف وكل حاجة ومهم قوي إن إحنا نستخدمها in between the patients. And once we do that, خلاص this is uh, enough. إحنا كل السانيتايزرز اللي احنا بنستخدمها دلوقتي معتمد على ان فيها كحول 70% وي نو ان ذيس از افكتف فور ذا ليزر فور فور ذا فيروس يعني فما فيش حاجه اكتر من كده غير ان انا uh, بعمل كليننج للسيرفيس اوف ذا بيشنت ذا سكين اوف سيرفيس يعني وبعمل كليننج للهاند بيس اللي انا بستخدمها قبل وبعد البروسيجر اند ذاتس ات لو عملنا كده ذير از نو ريسك اوف ترانسميشن Do you agree? يعني الدكتور yes, عبير ودكتور شادي انتوا عندكم اي يعني في اي حاجه في الكلام ده يعني مش لا 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 احنا وي فولو ذا سيم رولز بالظبط اللي انت قلتها يا دكتور اشرف انا يمكن بس في حاجه بعملها لما تكون النظارات مش واضحه بغمض بس انا ما انصحش ما انصحش حد انه يعملها بس انا بغمض عيني وبستخدم البلينكينج افكت يعني بظبط الصوت الصفاره بتاعت الليزر مع حركه عيني ان انا اقفلها وافتحها بس ده انا يعني انا فيري بروفيشنال في الموضوع ده بقالي سنين لكن انا ما انصحش حد ابدا ان هو يعمل كده تمام محتاجه تريننج يا دكتور محتاجه تريننج اه طبعا طيب سؤال يا دكتور اشرف بعد اذن حضرتك السيفتي آه بتاعت الاكزايمر في الايلاند سبيشال الحالات اللي في اللايف اه ده سؤال كويس جدا جدا وده من الحاجات اللي انا اي 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 strongly recommend ان احنا نستخدم الانترا اوكولار شيلد لانه لانه ال... احنا قلنا الاكزايمر ليزر ده من اللي هو الالترا فايلوت ليزر وده اللي هو ممكن يعمل كورنيال اوباستي وممكن يعمل دامج في ال... في اللينس كمان كاتاركت يعني كيميكال كاتاركت فعشان كده الانترا اوكولار شيلد في الحاله دي هيبقى مهم لان احنا واحنا بنشتغل على الايليد الجوجل العاديه بتاعه البيشنت مش هتنفع ما انا محتاج ان انا احطه على الليد فيبقى ساعتها الانترا اوكيال شيلد اللي احنا عرضناها في البرزنتيشن دي لازم تستخدم البايخ في الموضوع ان الاكزايمر ليزر بيستخدم مرتين لثلاث مرات في الاسبوع فالقصه دي هنحتاج ان احنا نعملها مرتين او ثلاثه في الاسبوع فالموضوع بيبقى شويه مزعج انما فروم ماي بيرسونال بوينت اوف فيو ات از فيري امبورتنت تو دو ذات عشان تو مينيمايز ذا كومبليكيشنز اللي ممكن تحصل على الاي سؤال لسه جاي حالا يا دكتور اشرف كان وي كلين سكان باي الكول بيفور ليزر سيشن كان وي كلين يعني كلين سكان 
باي الكحول بيفور ليزر سيشن اه طبعا احنا ممكن نعمل كده بس المشكله ان الالكوهول لازم نستنى تو بي فابورايزد وفي نفس الوقت محتاجين نعرف انه الالكوهول بيسبب دراينس اوف ذا سكين ف نبقى منبهين البيشنت اللي بعدها لازم يبقى بيستخدم موشرايزرز عشان ما يحصلش دراينس ناس كتير قوي الفتره دي عشان استخدام السانيتايزرز كتير بيشتكوا ان ايدهم بقت فيري دراي عشان الريبيتد يوز اوف سانيتايزرز اللي فيها الكوهول بس فهم دول النقطتين اللي اتحطوا في الاعتبار انما الالكوهول از يوزد فور ستريلايزيشن يس طب استخدام البي ليزر لوشن يا دكتور اشرف يعني مثلا انا بعمل بدي ابوينت قبل الجلسه بدي لوشن قبل الجلسه مم. انا مش بتكلم على الجيل اللي هو بتاع الديود أيوة. لا بتكلم عموما أيوة. ده ممكن يساعدني ان اقلل الفلوز اللي بتخرج من الجلسه هو شوف كل ما الويل الجلد يبقى السكين يبقى كل ما هيبقى الموضوع بتاع البلوم ده هيبقى اقل شويه يعني انت البلوم دي بيبقى اكتر حتى في الهير ريموفل لو السكين دراي لو السكين ويل هايدريتد هيبقى القصه دي اقل صح عشان كده ساعات انا بقول لو الجلد فيه دراينس بفضل ان احنا نستخدم حاجه اسمها كلينزنج ميلك ننظف الجلد وفي نفس الوقت بيدي هايدريشن وبعدين اشيل كل التريسز بتاعته وبعدين ابتدي اشتغل مهم قوي ان احنا ما يبقاش فيه اي تريسز بقدر الامكان لان التريسز بتاعت اي سكين كير برودكت هتزود الريفلكشن والسكاترنج فتقلل الافكت صح؟ بالظبط فالكلام ده هيبقى هيقلل لي الافكاسي سبيشالي لو الشعر رفيع شويه لو الشعر فيك ما عندناش مشكله. الحاجه الثانيه ان احنا في بعض الحاجات نفضل ان احنا نحط جيل الكليف جيل اللي هو الكولينج جيل عشان تو دامب ده ده اي تيشو سكاترنج يعني مثلا دلوقتي كنا بنعمل جايدلاينز uh, عشان الموضوع بتاع البراكتس ف uh, في بعض الحاجات خوفا من الكوفيد وخوفا من البارتيكلز والفايرال بارتيكلز الكلام ده في بعض الحاجات اللي انا ما كنتش بحب ابدا احط عليها كولينج جيل دلوقتي اي وود بوت ا كولينج جيل زي مثلا تريتمنت اوف فاسكولار ليجنز او تريتمنت اوف تاتوز او تريتمنت اوف بيجمنتد ليجنز وذ كي سويتش ليزرز لو حطيت ثين لاير اوف كولينج جيل وعملت الليزر من فوقيها ما فيش اي تيشو سبلتر هيحصل كله هيبقى دم تحت الجيل ده مش هيطلع فساعتها بقلل البوتنشال ريسك اوف سبريدنج ذا ذا بارتيكلز في الجو فذيس از سمثينج ويتش وي كان دو اتس نوت جوينج تو ديكريز ذا افيكاسي سبيشالي لما يكون الكروموفور دنستي عالي عالي طيب في سؤال جاي بيقول انه لو حد بيشتغل في منطقه حوالين الاي بالارفيوم ياج او بالارفيوم جلاس يعمل تايتنس للاي ليد فهنا يقدر يحط الشيلد ولا هيبقى ده مش مفترض يحط على اساس ان ممكن الهيت تبقى ترانسميتد للشيلد ويعمل يعني سايد افكت في فرق كبير بين الارفيوم ياج وبين الارفيوم جلاس يا دكتور عبير الارفيوم جلاس ده نون ابليتيف ريجوفينيشن غالبا بيبقى فراكشنال الديبث اوف بنتريشن بتاعه ساعات بيوصل لاب تو 1.5 ملم 1500 مايكرونز يعني و- وده ممكن يعمل اي دامج ولما بعمله يبقى المفروض ان انا احط انفرا اوكولار شيلد اون ذا اذر هاند الاربيام ياج ليزر از ماتش مور سوبرفيشال والافكت بيبقى على الابيديرمس وبيبقى ابليتيف مور ذان اني ثينج ايلس في بعض انواع الاربيام ياج ليزر بنقدر ان احنا تو يوز فيري لونج بالس ديوليشن So it doesn't have ablation, but has, it has thermal effect, but still it's very superficial. Uh, ideally, we should put the intraocular shield. In urban yag, we can work without the intraocular shield because it's very superficial, but it is preferable to use the intraocular shield. In urban glass, it is a must to use the intraocular shield. برضه كان في سؤال بيقول لو حد طلب انه يعمل هير ريدكشن في منطقه الاي براو يعني يشيل الاي براو هير بالليزر ف ده يعني مسموح بيه ولا لا؟ المفروض احنا قلنا يعني اتفضل حضرتك رد في في كونتروفرسيز في الحاجات دي في الموضوع ده بالذات في بعض الناس زي مثلا كريستين ديركس وبعض الناس البايونيرز بتوع الليزر اللي بيقولوا نيفر دو ذات انا من وجهه نظري لو خدنا البريكوشنز نقدر ان احنا نعمل لو عايزين نعمل تريمنج لفيو هيرز نقدر ان احنا نعملها بروفايدد ان احنا ناخد الرايت بريكوشنز ايه الرايت بريكوشنز 
نمره واحد نستخدم سمول سبوت سايز ما حدش في الحته دي يروح يشتغل ب 15 ملي سبوت سايز ديبث اوف بنتريشن از جوينج تو بي تو ماتش من غير اي داعي بيبقى ساعتها في ريسك اوف انجرينج ذا اي اكتر انما لو استخدمت 5 ملي او 6 ملي سبوت سايز هيبقى ده كافي جدا ان انا اوصل للديبث اوف بنتريشن انا عايزه من غير ما يبقى في ريسك دي نمره واحد نمره اثنين وذس از فيري امبورتنت انه الدايركشن بتاع الهاند بيس اوف ذا ليزر should never be direct towards the eye يعني دايما لو انا هعمل كده ابقى بخلي الهاند بيس انا مش عارف انا باين في الـ في السكرين ولا لا آه، واضح أيوة. بس يبقى الهاند بيس دايركشن بتاع الليزر جاي من تحت لفوق بحيث ان انا ابقى away from the direction of the eye ما يبقاش ماشي في الاتجاه ده ما يبقاش انا ماسك الهاند بيس كده بحيث ان الديبث اوف بنتريشن ممكن يدخل لحد العين ابقى upwards away from the direction of the eye ساعتها لو عملت الكلام ده خلاص في الدايركشن ده هبقى ما فيش اي هازلز على الاي سمول سبوت سايز ودايركشن اوف ذا ليزر بيم اواي فروم ذا اي هيبقى ساعتها ما عنديش اي مشكله سؤال يا دكتور من احد الزملاء معلش هو سؤال طبعا بيتسال كتير الفتره بيتكرر دايما معانا في المؤتمرات ينفع نحط ماده الكربون على الوايت هير ونشتغل بالاي بي ال يعني از سوجنس كروموفور ده هيساعدني انا عارف ان طبعا الاجازه في حركه الاسماك تمام هو الحقيقه ناس كتير حاولت انها تعمل القصه دي علشان ياثروا على الوايت هير بس هو وجد انه اي ستينز بنعملها حتى الهير دايز والكلام ده كله ما بتدخلش للهير فولكل نفسها بتعمل ستيننج للشافت واحنا التارجت اللي احنا عايزين ناثر عليه هو الهير فولكل فعلشان كده الموضوع بتاع الكربون سسبنشنز ما نفعتش لان الكربون بارتيكلز اكبر حجمها اكبر من ان هي توصل لحد الهير فولكل بس بتاثر على الشافت ويتش از نوت انف موافقه دكتور عبير ولا في اي اه طبعا اه ده موافقه موافقه طبعا جدا انا بس بنشوف ان في اسئله كتيره جايه على الهير واحنا قلنا ان احنا هنحاول نخليها في المؤتمر ان شاء الله تمام بالظبط على اساس فقلنا ان شاء الله ان يعني لكن السيفتي اعتقد احنا غطيناه يا دكتور طيب شادي في في بس موضوع مهم انا شفت الكويشن ده كويشن عايز اقوله لان دي معلومه انا لسه انا شخصيا اتعلمتها قريب وحابب ان انا اشاركها معاكم السؤال كان على موضوع شود وي شيف اي براو بيفور تاتو ريموفل ولا لا مشكلة كبيرة بتحصل اه مشكلة كبيرة بتحصل ان احنا لما بنستخدم الكيو سويتش ليزرز فور تاتو ريموفل بيحصل الاول بليتشنج للهير وبعد كده بيقع في خلال اسبوع او اسبوعين وبعد كده بيجرو باك بس سم تايمز ات تيكس لونج تايم فور ذا ري جروث اوف ذا هير وده بيضايق البيشنت كوزماتيكلي ما بتبقاش عايزة كده صح؟ وكنت انا لحد قريب يعني مش لاقي حل الموضوع ده خلاص ذيس از ذا بروسيس وخلاص اتعلمت قريب ان احنا لو حطينا فيري ثين لاير اوف فازلين وغطينا الاي براو ات از جوينج تو كفر ذا هير وبروتكت ذا هير فروم ذا افكت اوف ذا ليزر وفي نفس الوقت ات از جوينج تو بي ترانسبيرنت فالليزر هيعديه وياثر على التاتو ساعتها الهير مش هيقع ف ذيس از وات وي دو وي دونت نيد تو شيف لان If you didn't shave, uh, هو الشعر هيقع كده كده بس احنا بنبقى مش عايزين ان هو يقع ف thin layer of vaseline just before the laser and then you do the tattoo removal the hair is not is going to be protected. انا حبيت بس اضيف الحكايه دي لان اتعلمتها قريب. تمام يا دكتور شكرا اعتقد ان احنا غطينا يعني معظم الاسئله اسئله متكرره كتير يعني ذا سيم جبنا لحد دلوقتي انا بس بنوه ان احنا الحاجات اللي انتوا بتسالوها ريجاردنج الهير بالذات الهير واخد يعني الحظ الكبير من الاسئله هيجي يوم سبيسيفيك للهير عشان بس الناس ما تقلقش لا في يوم هيبقى سبيسيفيك للهير فقط او سيشن للهير كامله وده حتى اشار بدرما في المؤتمر في شهر 7 باذن الله. دكتور عبير انا طبعا متشكره جدا حقيقه انا استمتعت بالمحاضره لاقصى درجه واستفدت من الاسئله واستفدت طبعا من الاجابات ودايما في تبادل خبرات ودايما في حاجات جديده بت 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 بتبقى قدام الواحد فاحنا بنشكرك جدا جدا يا دكتور اشرف وبنشكر الناس اللي كانوا حاضرين معانا وان شاء الله نشوفكم في في المؤتمر باذن الله يعني. انا اللي بشكركم وبشكر الدكتور شادي وبشكرك يا دكتور عبير دايما بسعد ان احنا نكون مع بعض يعني اتس ريل بليزر 
ان احنا نكون مع بعض في اي عمل وبشكر مره اخرى شرم ديرما واستاذنا الدكتور عاصم فرج لترتيب الويبينار ده والسبونسرنج كامبانيز للمجهود بتاعهم والسبورت بتاعهم وكل اللي حضروا واتمنى ان يكون يعني كان في فايده من السيشن بتاعت النهارده الحمد لله انا احب بس اشكر برضو شركه الاهليه الوكيل اليومنس كانت سبونسر لعلى النهارده يمكن هضيف بس حاجه لطيفه في الباس بتاعهم بتاع السبلندر اللي هو بتاع الهير رش ان هو من الاجهزه اللي مركبها الباك يام دكتور اشرف يعني الباك يام عشان يمنع تماما ريحه حتى الشعر اللي بيتحرق او الفلومز اللي خارجه من الهير رش فدي طبعا. فكره اعتقد ريجارد السيفتي هتبقى هايله جدا على الاقل هتعمل اليمينيشن بشكل كبير للفلوم بتاعته طبعا هي دي حاجه كويسه جدا والفاكيوم اللي بيحصل مع الليزر ده هو ده اللي يمكن ان الانرجي اللي بتستخدم تبقى اقل بكتير من اذر دايود ليزرز وفي نفس الوقت الفاكيوم ده بيعمل كومبريشن للبلاد فيسلز فبنليمينيت الاوكسي موجلوبين من الايكويشن بيبقى بس الميلانين والهير فوليكلز بتبقى اقرب بكتير للسورس بتاع الليزر وبالتالي الانرجي قليله بتجيب نتائج كويسه جدا وذ ماتش ليس بين والسبوت بيبقى كبير فدفنت ده من السيستمز الكويسه جدا جدا از لونج از ذا هير ستيك عشان كده هو متميز وهنا في كندا ده من اكتر الحاجات اللي بتستخدم في الهير ريموفر. بالاضافه كمان في جهاز تاني يا دكتور اشرف كمان في اير فاكيوم شماط هواء راكب مع الهاند بيس كمان تمام. ده الجهاز اللي هو الاليكس وير. تمام ده مهم جدا أخبر. جدا طبعا زي زي ما انا قلت الكارسينوجينز والتوكسيك ماتيرز اللي بتطلع مع الفيومز بتاعه الهير ريدكشن فحاجه زي كده هتبقى بتقلل الريسك والاريتيشن الريسبيرتوري اريتيشن ممكن تحصل فطبعا الحمد لله اليوم كان جميل جدا انا بصراحه يعني يعني بتشرف ان انا كنت عديت على مدرسه معهد الليزر اللي حضرتك واحد منها والدكتور عبير ده فعلا اسقني علما وده بفضلكم والله بجد وهفضل اتعلم منكم كل يوم حتى النهارده انا خارج بمعلومات جديده استاذ العزيز الدكتور اشرف استاذ العزيز الدكتور عبير ويا رب دايما كده نجمع على خير واوقات افضل من كده بكتير يعني ان شاء الله السوشيال ديستنس باذن الله انا بشكر جداً. بس استاذ الدكتور عاصم فرج والشركه الاهليه والتيم اللي قاعد معانا بيشتغل مش عارف هيروحوا ازاي في الحظ <تصفيق> <تصفيق> يعني احنا <تصفيق> معانا رخصه يا دكتوره لكن المشكله بقى في التيم يعني ربنا يحفظكم جميعا وان شاء الله نلتقي قريبا وجها لوجه باذن الله ان شاء الله اشكرك يا دكتور شكرا شكرا على السلامه